It's late on a Saturday night in New York City, 11.55 p.m. to be exact. A man is running towards the subway station on 59th Street. He's just gotten off from work at the restaurant where he waits tables, and he's in a hurry to get home and spend some time with his girlfriend. As he approaches the station, he notices something strange. Someone has placed a wooden barrier in front of the entrance. The man has never seen something like this before, but he hasn't lived in Brooklyn very long. Everything about the station looks normal behind the barrier, and he's in a hurry. He doesn't want to have to go several blocks to the next station, so he hops the barrier. What's the worst that could happen? As the man walks onto the train platform, he starts to second-guess his decision. The platform is empty, and come to think of it, he hasn't seen anyone in the station at all. Maybe he did make a mistake. Maybe the station really is closed for repairs. He turns around to leave, but just as he does, he hears a train. Good. Everything is normal. He checks his watch. 11.57 p.m. on the dot. The train comes to a stop, and its doors slide open. It looks a little older than the trains he usually rides, but it appears to be in perfect shape, and it's going the direction of his home. So he steps on board. Just like the station and the platform, there's no one else on the train. Strange. But he's ridden nearly empty trains before, especially late at night, though usually at this time on a Saturday there's at least a few people on board. Just then, he hears something in the station. He turns to see someone running down the platform crying out. Stop! Stop! The man in the mass transit authority vest cries, dropping what looks to be his dinner on the platform as he runs. While the MTA worker is still several feet away, the doors snap shut and the train begins to move. The MTA worker cries out again to stop, but he knows there's no point. He watches as the train heads down the tracks and disappears into the darkness. With a sigh, he takes out a walkie-talkie and it squawks to life. We've lost another one, he says. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-052, also known as the Time Traveling Train. SCP-052 appears to be a standard-looking Type R4 New York City subway train. Official city records state that the train was built in 1932 and decommissioned for scrap in 1975. Despite the fact that it should no longer exist, SCP-052 continues to appear on the Uptown AD track at the 59th Street and 8th Avenue station at exactly 11.57 p.m. every Saturday night. The train appears to be in perfect condition just the same as when it was built over 80 years ago, and it is marked as an A-train. Each Saturday, the train arrives at exactly the same time, opens its doors to accept or discharge passengers for precisely five minutes, then closes its doors and disappears until the next week. Where did the train come from? And where does it go in between the weekly appearances? These are questions the SCP Foundation is trying to answer. But perhaps the most frightening aspect of SCP-052 is that once you get on the train, there's no guarantee of ever getting off. Sadly, the majority of subjects that have been observed boarding SCP-052 have not been heard from again. The rare few that have been recovered claim to have boarded the train on various dates, ranging from 1976 all the way to the year 2204, with the latter claiming he thought he was boarding a special 300th anniversary train. Thus far, none of the recovered passengers have reported any memories or knowledge of their time on board the train between entering and exiting. Any passengers spotted disembarking from SCP-052 are to be immediately brought to Site-21 for questioning, to determine their origin and assess whether they pose any threat to the current time stream. The Foundation has had great success administering Class A amnestics to passengers who arrived from the past and reintegrating them into society. But any passenger who is identified as being from the future must be held indefinitely to prevent potential disruptions to this reality's time stream. Per Order 69-A1 from 05 Council Member 05-9, there are currently 26 recovered passengers being held at Site 21 who fit this description, and there are not yet any procedures in place that would allow for their safe release into modern society, nor has there been any workable theories for how to return them to their original home time. Despite the protocols in place to prevent public access, some passengers from the present have still managed to accidentally board SCP-052, and subjects from other times continue to appear. Following interviews, it's been discovered that some of these subjects arrive from alternate timelines and realities. This raises the question of whether it is possible for SCP-052 
to appear in other times and places, which may require the containment of additional locations, and reports of any suspicious activity involving unscheduled trains are being monitored and investigated around the world. Following its initial discovery, several tests were attempted in order to better understand the anomalous train and what may be happening when it is no longer visible. The first test took place on May 31, 2009. An agent was told to simply board the train. They did as requested, and have yet to be recovered as of the present date. A second test took place a week later on June 6. This agent too was never recovered, though reports indicate that he may have returned to our timeline in 1980, at which point he was killed in a confrontation that has since been classified. A third test was conducted the next week on June 13. Once again, the agent was told to board the train and did so. This time, though, the agent returned. Just two weeks later, on June 27, the agent stepped back off the train, with his hands appearing to have been surgically removed. A note had been placed in his pocket that had the simple message, Send No More, written on it. The agent claims not to remember any of his experiences on the train over the two weeks he was gone, or what may have happened to his hands. Following this third test, O5 Command issued orders stopping the use of Foundation agents as passengers on SCP-052. D-Class, due to their disposable nature as convicted felons and death row inmates, were considered as potential replacements for the agents in the exploration of SCP-052, but the risk of releasing them into the past or the future was determined to be too great. Other than the agent who knowingly boarded the train, several other notable passengers have been recovered. One case involved the recovery of a woman who entered the train on July 14, 2012, but was recovered four years earlier, on March 8, 2008. She entered the train while on her way home from the theater, and was surprised to learn she traveled four years into the past. Because another version of her existed at the time she was recovered, she was held to prevent unwanted temporal effects. Another subject was recovered in 2008 who claimed to be from the year 1976. Although there was nothing physically wrong with him and no risk of time stream disruptions, Foundation psychiatrists recommended that he be held indefinitely, as 32 years was believed to be too long a period of time to successfully reintegrate into society. Perhaps the most interesting recovery was of a man claiming to be a Level 4 supervisor from the SCP Federation, who boarded the train in December of 2124. He said that he had been administered a Class A amnestic prior to boarding and remembered nothing until his recovery in 2010. While the agent can clearly never be released into society, O5 Command has approved the sharing of classified information about various anomalies, in the hopes that he can provide additional information on possible containment procedures. Because SCP-052 has so far proven impossible to stop or remove from the New York City subway system, it has been classified as Euclid but its predictable nature means that the Foundation is usually able to prevent the public from encountering it. The 59th Street ABCD station is closed to the public between 11 p.m. on Saturday night and 1 a.m. on Sunday morning, under the pretext of track maintenance. Any passengers seen leaving SCP-052 must be taken to Site-21 for debriefing and processing, and members of the public who simply see SCP-052 may be released after the administration of a Class B amnestic. As for what happens to most of the passengers who board SCP-052 and are never seen from again, we simply don't know. A violent storm rocks a merchant ship back and forth. Huge waves roll over the deck and threaten to capsize the vessel. A merchant sailor grips the railing, trying with all his might not to be thrown overboard. With a loud twang, a cable snaps loose. A hand suddenly grabs his shoulder. He turns around with a fright to see that it's one of his shipmates. He points towards the bow of the ship and yells over the roar of the storm that they need to try and repair it. The two men make their way to the front of the ship and the sailor starts working to fix the broken cable. He looks up to see that his mate is no longer working. He's staring straight past him and there's fear in his eyes. The sailor turns around to see a massive tentacle sticking out of the sea. The huge appendage is mind-boggling in its size. He can only stand there, marveling at it, until it begins violently smashing against the deck. The sailor dives out of the way just before the tentacle crashes down right where he was standing, where his crewmate was still locked in fear. The ship is in chaos as more tentacles appear and slam the deck over and over. 
One cracks the deck right next to him, sending him flying. He comes to moments later in a wreckage pile. Nothing else has changed, though. Whatever this monster is, it's not stopping its assault on the ship. The sailor stands up and picks up a sharpened piece of wood from the pile he was lying in. He runs over to the nearest tentacle and thrusts the sharpened stick into its flesh. There's a mighty roar from the sea, and the tentacles stop their onslaught. They go limp before sliding into the sea. The sailor looks around at the carnage that's been wrought. Dead bodies and debris litter the deck. He moves to check on his crewmates, when right in front of him, bursting from the sea, is the head of the biggest squid he has ever seen, a massive beast that must be a thousand meters long. Whatever he had seen before of this creature was truly just the tip of the iceberg. With another roar, the creature lifts up out of the water and wraps its arms around the ship. The sailor only has time to duck down and close his eyes before the entire ship is pulled down beneath the waves. With a gasp, the sailor breaks the surface, screaming and gulping for air. He's alone now, treading water in the middle of the ocean during a storm, but not for long. The squid reappears, its head slowly rising out of the water just in front of him. Its head, the size of a house, has two giant, uncaring black eyes that seem to both see him and not. It extends a tentacle toward him as it leans back in the water, exposing its huge, beaked mouth. It wraps its powerful arms around him and starts to pull him towards it, when suddenly, there's an explosion. The squid has been struck by something. Both the sailor and the creature turn to see the most incredible thing. A battleship is coming towards them, slowly rising out of the ocean as if it were somehow submerged, and it's firing on the creature. The squid drops him and starts heading towards the ship. This is going to be a battle for the ages. While this sailor had no idea what he was witnessing, the SCP Foundation was all too familiar. This was yet another incident of SCP-2846, also known as The Squid and the Sailor. But first, a quick personal request from me. I need your help to spread the word about the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives. The best thing you can do to help me is subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This is a huge help and will let me bring you more and more SCP anomalies. Now back to our file. SCP-2846 is the name given to a set of phenomena that occur in the Gulf Atlantic region. These phenomena consist of interactions between two entities, known as SCP-2846-A and SCP-2846-B. 2846-A is a gigantic, aquatic creature that resembles a cephalopod, though no similar organism has been discovered that is even close to approaching its size, with estimates placing 2846-A at being at least 950 meters in length. This creature appears in areas of deep water during storms and will attack civilian vessels, especially cruise ships and merchant vessels. These attacks are sporadic and follow no known patterns other than that they take place during inclement weather. They are sudden and without warning and will nearly always result in the complete destruction of the targeted vessel if they're not intercepted. Attempting to stop these attacks is SCP-2846-B, a large seafaring vessel that in its current form resembles a Pennsylvania-class super dreadnought battleship, though it appears hazy in photos and videos as if translucent, and eyewitness observers have described the ship as looking vaporous. Just like SCP-2846-A, this ship will appear from deep water, surfacing near the site of a 2846-A event. The vessel will fire on the creature, drawing its attention, and the two will then engage in a heated battle. The two will continue fighting until SCP-2846-A is rendered immobile or completely incapacitated, after which it will sink down into the sea. Following its victory, the ship too will then submerge and disappear beneath the waves. SCP-2846-A is believed to have existed for thousands of years, and maybe even older than that. The creature's existence was first recorded in an Icelandic saga from the 13th century, but the Foundation's first documented sighting came in 1905, when an agent working for the Foundation, one Admiral Reginald von Allen, spotted the creature surfacing with a whale wrapped effortlessly in its tentacles. Soon after spotting it, a ship of the line surfaced as well to do battle with the creature. The Admiral tried to signal the crew that he could see on the deck of the ship, but the vessel descended back below the surface before any communication could take place. 
1935, the mysterious ship appeared again, near the SCPS Hildegard, and this time, the anomalous vessel was the one to initiate communication. Some of the crew of the ship, designated as SCP-2846-B1 through B915, came aboard the Foundation ship and engaged in a conversation with Captain Levy Hansen. SCP-2846-B1 identified himself as David Thomas Jones of the Royal Navy, and went on to explain that their ship had been sunk by a monster resembling SCP-2846-A over 300 years in the past. He described how after sinking into the darkness of the sea, he awoke on a mysterious shore where he met with a woman who referred to herself as Calypso, the goddess of the sea. She explained how she had sealed the leviathans that prowled the depths of the ocean in a pit, but that over time, the seal she had placed on it had begun to weaken. A titan had escaped and taken the form of the most deadly creature in the sea, the Kraken. Calypso feared that the creature would attempt to further destroy the seal and release its monstrous brethren, a disaster that would result in the end of all human life. She requested that Jones pursue the creature along with his crew for as long as needed, and in return, they would be granted immortality. Jones agreed, and his endless battle against the anomaly began that day. The reason he had now come aboard a Foundation ship was directly related to this task. SCP-2846-A had grown more powerful over the years, larger and bolder too. He and his men couldn't die, but many more would if they were no longer able to subdue the beast. He needed something from the SCP Foundation. He needed a bigger boat. Following this conversation and seeing the value in allowing Jones and his crew to continue their mission, the Foundation commandeered a newly built Pennsylvania-class Super Dreadnought battleship from the US Navy the USS Montana. The ship was sunk 15 kilometers from a Foundation naval facility in Cuba. 30 hours later, the ship surfaced from the sea, though it was now more heavily armed than the USS Montana had been. As part of the agreement, SCP-2846-B was fitted with an explosive device that is capable of completely destroying the ship should the crew for some reason ever turn their guns on Foundation or other human targets. In 2013, an important discovery was made after a tracker was attached to SCP-2846-A. Deep in the Atlantic, roughly 1,300 nautical miles west of Florida, a depression in the ocean floor with a large iron object on top of it was found. 2846 seems to return to this site over and over, where it has been observed clearing the rocks from the area. And it appears that it is almost finished with its task. The iron plate on top of the depression is nearly exposed. It's not known exactly what's underneath, but whatever it is, it's hot. Very hot, with temperatures near it measured at over 4,000 degrees Celsius. It's feared that whatever the creature is trying to unearth, it would lead to an XK end-of-the-world scenario, and it is imperative that it not be allowed to do so. And there's more bad news when it comes to SCP-2846. In 2014, the Foundation ship SCPS Pristine was pursuing a large underwater organism assumed to be SCP-2846-A and signaled to 2846-B to surface and dispatch the creature in what had become the normal operating procedure. Something strange happened though, and the pristine was suddenly struck by a mysterious force. As SCP-2846-B began to engage with the now surfaced 2846-A, the crew of the pristine reported seeing numerous eyes appearing and disappearing in the water below the ship. They had never seen anything like it. The ship was struck again, as satellite images spotted an enormous entity directly beneath the ship. The pristine began taking on water, and the crew was forced to abandon ship. Two other SCP ships in the area fired on the strange, many-eyed entity, causing it to once again disappear into the depths of the ocean, as SCP-2846-B banished 2846-A to the ocean once again. Due to the ongoing danger of SCP-2846-A, it has been classified as Keter. In the event of an appearance, Mobile Task Force Tau-11, also known as the Can Openers, who are stationed aboard the SCPS Nikolai, are to utilize a special transmission device to signal the crew of SCP-2846-B and maintain contact with them throughout their engagement with the creature. Tau-11's primary mission is to minimize civilian exposure to the anomaly, and any non-Foundation ships that come in contact with either 2846 entity are to be moved from the area, and all aboard the craft are to be given Class C amnestics. The SCPS Nikolai's captain has been given permission to fire on SCP-2846-A to assist in the fight, and should 2846-B turn hostile for any reason, the explosive device on board 
is to be detonated. It is still unknown just what the entity that attacked and destroyed the SCPS Pristine was, but the ease with which it dispensed of the vessel has many in the Foundation worried that SCP-2846-A has already been able to release one of its brethren from its prison, and at this point, stopping them may no longer be an option. A worker presses down on the plunger, and moments later, a huge explosion rocks the quarry. When the dust clears, the three quarry workers look on at the pile of rocks that they'll now spend the next days and weeks hauling out. But then, they spot something strange. There in the newly exposed rock face is an opening. The three men stand at the mouth of the previously hidden cave. They poke their heads inside, but it's too dark to see much of anything, except for the fact that the tunnel in the rock stretches on for at least a few meters before it turns and prevents them from seeing any further. One of the quarry workers slaps his co-worker on the back and dares him to go inside and check it out. No way, he tells him as he pulls his hand back from feeling inside the cave wall, his palm now coated in a sickly slime. It's gross in there. The other two laugh at him. If they think they're so brave, why don't the two of them go check it out? The two men stop laughing and look at each other. Who could have ever foreseen the tables turning on them like this? But they're not going to back down. One of the two takes out a flashlight and they step into the cave while the third waits outside. He watches as the two of them head deeper into the cave, disappearing behind the bend. Inside the cave, the floor is just like the walls, coated with some kind of substance making it wet, but also a little sticky. They half expected the cave to end right around the bend, but now they can see that it continues on. Not only is there another turn several meters ahead of them, but as they head deeper in, they find that there are branching paths too, this might just be the start of a vast cave system. There's no telling how far or how deep it might go. They better head back to the entrance before they get lost. The two turn around to start heading back towards the entrance. But wait, what was that? They spin around. It sounded like there was a noise behind them. But there's nothing there, just the empty passageway. They must be hearing things. They really should get out of here quickly, though. Come on, let's go. As they turn to leave, though, something happens. With a sickening squishing sound, the walls of the tunnel constrict, closing up between them. He runs towards the now-closed passage and starts slapping at the moist, soft wall, but there's no response. But then he does hear something. Was that a scream? He's realized something else, too. Even though his friend had the flashlight, he can still see. While faint, the walls themselves seem to be producing a small amount of light. He yells out that he's going to get help and that his friend should hold tight and not move. He'll get him out of there. He has no idea if he can hear him, though. He starts to slowly make his way back the way he thinks they came, but the cave feels different. He's taking turns that he doesn't remember making on their short trip. He should be at the entrance already, and there seem to be more branching paths than there were before. It's hard to tell in the low light, though. Maybe he's just confused. He's hearing noises, too. Wet, writhing sounds. He's got to get out of here. The quarry worker reaches a fork in the tunnel and has no idea which is the right way to go. He doesn't remember this at all. He calls down the tunnel, but there's no answer to his cries. He hears more of those wet, slapping sounds behind him, though. He's got to keep moving. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. The left tunnel it is. He goes down his chosen path, rounds a corner, and sees another fork. What is going on here? He's got to pick, though. Eeny, meeny, miny. He screams as something leaps out of the tunnel at him. Outside the cave, the quarry worker is growing nervous. He's gotten a flashlight of his own and shines it down the tunnel, but he can't see any more than they could before. He calls out, asking if they're all right, but he's met only with silence. He turns around behind him at the empty quarry. They're the only ones working on the site that day, and if they don't get back to work soon, there's going to be some angry questions about why they spent the day horsing around inside of a cave. As much as he hates the idea, He's got to go in there and get them out. He enters the cave and goes around the first bend. He too notices how oddly sticky and slimy every surface is, but he has to press on. Maybe they were hurt and needed his help. He rounds another bend and spots something, a pair of legs sticking out from around the next turn. His friend must really have been hurt. He runs towards his injured co-worker and kneels down next to him. It looks like he's passed out on the ground and he tries to shake him awake. Are you okay? What happened? His friend moans a bit, but doesn't even open his eyes. He moans again, and this time blood starts pouring out of his mouth. The quarry worker steps back, scared at the sight of his friend's state. 
That's when he notices something. His friend's stomach. It's moving. He leans in close. He can see bumps swelling and moving around his abdomen. Is that? The SCP Foundation soon learned of the troubling reports and moved quickly to purchase the quarry and the surrounding lands. Those who had seen or heard rumors about the missing workers were amnestitized, and all further access to the area around the quarry was strictly controlled. The cave itself that had been unearthed was designated SCP-2385, but the Foundation needed to learn just what they were dealing with, so after a research outpost was constructed over the entrance, the investigation into what was happening inside this strange anomalous cavern system could finally begin. The first to enter the cave is D-11424, a Class D personnel, who is equipped with a shoulder-mounted camera, a Ruger LC-9 pistol, a machete, and one week's worth of rations, since it was unknown just how vast this cave system may be. D-11424 proceeds into the cave and immediately reports back the same conditions that the workers had experienced, that the surfaces of the cave were soft, wet, and a little sticky, and also that they seemed to have an almost imperceptible glow. D-11424 moves deeper into the cave, but sees no sign of the missing workers, despite one of their bodies having been reported as being lost relatively close to the entrance. He's ordered to continue deeper into the cave, and radios back that the walls weren't stable. He would pass by openings in the walls that would seal off once he was passed. On more than one occasion, he saw new passages open up as well, and these didn't appear to be caused by collapses or other geological activity. The walls seemed like they were alive. But the walls were the only sign of life he could find. There was still no evidence of the missing workers or whatever might have gotten them. But then, after D-11424 rounds a corner, he sees that something is up ahead of him. It's not one of the workers. It's a creature, and one that looks like nothing he has ever seen before. The thing crawling on the floor of the cave looks like a giant worm, several feet in length, but with a grotesque, skinless human head. D-11424, frightened at the sight of this grotesque creature, turns to run, but it's too late. The worm has spotted him and charges at him immediately, slithering across the wet cave floor at an incredible speed. D-11424 slips and falls to the ground. His shoulder-mounted camera knocked off his body and left facing a wall, leaving the researchers monitoring the feed with nothing except the sound of his screams. Once contact was lost with the Class D personnel, the Foundation decided that due to the presence of hostile creatures within the cave system, that the next exploratory expedition would be undertaken without humans. The mission was authorized, and two months later, a remote-controlled drone designated A-47 was sent into the cave. Just like D-11424 and the quarry workers before saw, its camera captures passageways opening and closing in the living rock walls. As it progresses deeper, it eventually spots the same worm-like creatures with horrible human faces that look like they've had their skin removed, which have now been designated by the Foundation as SCP-2385-1 entities. And A-47 soon discovers a surprising fact about these bizarre organisms. They appear that they are being birthed right from the walls of the cave itself. As A-47 enters one of those largest rooms yet seen in the cave, its camera captures over a dozen 2385-1s growing out of the walls and ceiling in various stages of maturity. Some of them snap at A-47 as it passes by, trying to attack the drone, but luckily they're unable to reach. There's larger examples of the worms in the room too, and these ones also differ in appearance slightly, with a fibrous growth over their eyes. The researchers assume that these entities are different enough from the smaller versions that they warrant their own classification, and are designated as SCP-2385-2 entities. Luckily for A-47, these larger specimens, which can be as large as 4 meters in length, seem much more docile than their smaller counterparts and ignore A-47 as it passes by. A-47 then learns another shocking piece of information about these disturbing worm-like creatures. They're cannibalistic. Its camera relays footage back to the research team of a 2385-1 entity feeding on another, smaller one. It appears that they eat their prey whole after unhinging their grotesque jaws. The one feeding tries to lash out at A-47 with its tail, but can't reach him with half of another instance in its mouth, and the drone continues deeper into the cave. Just when A-47 enters the next chamber, a 2385-1 instance growing out of the ceiling drops down right in front of it leaving no way for the drone to get around it in the narrow section of cave. A-47 quickly turns around to seek out another path, but its camera captures the passage closing in front of it. 
A47, is trapped. The 2385-1 entity charges towards the remote-controlled drone and attacks, biting and slapping it with its powerful tail. It then attempts to consume it, but is unable to ingest the bulky drone and, instead, leaves the heavily damaged robot for dead, slithering away deeper into the cave. The battered drone lies immobile on the cave floor for several hours, its camera broadcasting until the last of its battery is finally about to run out. Just before it stops sending signals back to the research outpost, though, it captures something. The wall next to A47 opens up, and two of the larger SCP-2385-2 entities emerge from the new passageway. One of them approaches A47, as the other probes at the wall next to it with its head. It seems as though the larger of the entities are actually able to form new pathways in the cave, or at least open up doorways between existing ones. With the last of its battery power, A47 sends back a truly remarkable sight. Out of the hole opened by the 2385-2 entity appears D-11424. He's dirty, disheveled, sporting a month's worth of beard growth, and brandishing a machete. The wall opens up from the Dash-2 entity prodding at it, and the odd group exits through it. It's the last thing A-47 transmits back to the Foundation. Two months later, after several more failed manned missions, there was finally a success. An SCP-2385-2 instance that had wandered close to the entrance was retrieved from the cave system and brought back to a Foundation research site where a camera was surgically implanted in its head. The entity, which was designated as Subject Alpha, or SA, was then amnestitized and released back into the 2385 caves, allowing researchers to monitor how it behaved as it traveled through its home environment. The researchers watched as SA made its way through the cave system and stopped in another of the rooms filled with young versions of 2385-1. The larger entity approached several and appeared to nuzzle its face against theirs before moving on, which looked to have a calming effect on the extremely aggressive smaller versions. As it continues through the tunnels, SA sees a group of 2385-1 instances feeding on a deceased 2385-2. It appears that when 2385-1s are unable to swallow their prey whole, they burrow into the body and consume them from the inside out. Luckily, they are too distracted by their meal to pay any attention to SA, and it is able to pass by. SA then runs into two other 2385-2 entities, and the three begin traveling through the caves together. They are soon attacked by a smaller Dash-1, but the group is able to pin the biting and thrashing entity to the ground with their powerful tails, allowing SA to nuzzle it. Just like with the ones being birthed from the wall, this seems to calm the creature. But there is another effect as well. As the 2385-1 entity becomes more docile, the same fibrous growths that can be seen on the larger 2385-2 entities start to grow over its eyes. Is this how 2385-2s are created? The group of Dash 2s continues their journey through the tunnels, often stopping to prod at the walls to open new pathways. It appears that they are searching for something, looking around each new room they enter before moving on. Eventually, they run into something, but it doesn't appear to be what they wanted to find. They enter a new section of cave, and blocking the path in front of them is the largest SCP-2385-1 entity yet recorded. It's as big as the Dash 2s at over 7 meters in length and weighing an estimated 400 kilograms. It appears to be extremely hostile, but the Dash 2s seem to instinctively know that the only way forward is to go past this massive Dash 1. The trio nuzzles their heads together as if they are saying one final goodbye before one of the Dash 2s charges straight ahead. The Dash 1 attacks and quickly incapacitates it with its powerful tail and snapping jaws. It begins feeding on the Dash 2, giving SA and its one remaining companion the time they need to get past. As the now duo moves past, the other is attacked from a side tunnel by a group of regular-sized but ferocious Dash 1s. SA can't do anything to help. It seems to pick up the pace and continues on, but as it rounds a corner, it comes face to face with another large Dash 1 instance. It turns down a side tunnel to avoid it, but finds itself in a dead end. It prods at the wall as the Dash 1 rushes towards it, but no new passageways open. It turns around, seemingly resigned to its fate as the Dash 1 begins attacking. But just then, something else appears in the tunnel coming towards them. It's D-11424, charging forward with his machete raised in the air, his hair and beard both long and wild. He begins fighting the large Dash 1 entity, hacking at it with his machete until it finally dies. With the vicious entity now dead, he kneels down next to SA and begins stroking its head in a calming manner. Hey there, little guy. You all right? He asks as he pets the 2385-2. Yeah, you're fine. Get up. I know where it is. Come with me. 
SA struggles from its injuries, but is able to follow D-11424 as he leads it through the tunnels, with D-11424 stopping at one point to carve a piece off of the fleshy walls and consume it. The tunnels eventually open up into a large room that looks similar to the rest of the cave system, except there is a huge glowing orb at its center. It's a beautiful sphere of warm light that appears to be at least 10 meters in diameter. Here we are, the D-Class tells S.A. and motions towards the orb. It's all right. S.A. nuzzles against D-11424, perhaps one final thank you for saving its life, then instinctually seems to know what to do. The camera feed shows that it began crawling towards the sphere, and after a brief pause, started pushing itself inside. The camera recorded the brilliant light of the orb engulfing S.A. and its implanted camera before the feed finally cut out. The SCP Foundation would later discover that on that very same day, in the city of Elgin, Illinois, a local woman was admitted to the hospital after complaining of abdominal pains. Doctors performed emergency surgery and found something they did not expect. A micro camera had somehow become embedded inside of her body, which upon later investigations would be found to bear the same serial number as the one that had been implanted in SA. Following this strange event, SCP-2385, which had previously been classified as Euclid, was upgraded to Keter. An observation site has been built at the quarry and no further human expeditions are allowed inside. In a bit of good news, sometime later, D-11424 finally emerged from the cave system. He was taken back into SCP Foundation custody and continues engaging in exploratory missions on behalf of the Foundation to this day. You're on your way home from work after having just finished working a double shift. It's late and the interstate is completely abandoned, no cars visible either in front or behind you. It's only about a 20 minute drive, but you know you're going to struggle to stay awake, even in this old beater that shakes and rattles as it travels down the long straight road. The rattling causes a piece of tape to fall off of the gauge cluster, revealing a lit check engine light beneath. You grab the tape and put it back over the light, covering it once again. There, good as new. You turn on the radio, and it comes to life for just a moment before dying. You slap the radio and it blinks to life for just a second before dying again. You're about to slap it again when you notice lights in your rearview mirror, and more than just a pair of headlights, it's a whole wall of lights. They're getting closer, and quickly too. Before you know it, they look like they're barreling down on you. But then they suddenly go black, blinking out of existence. Did that trucker just turn off his lights, you think? You have no time to dwell on the thought because the sound of an explosion suddenly causes you to scream in fright. It sounds like lightning has struck just inches from your car. The inside of your car suddenly lights up with fire and smoke. Has your engine exploded? What's going on? No, it's not coming from you, it's coming from next to you. You don't know where it appeared from, but next to your car is now a massive semi. At least, you think it was a semi. The smoke is so thick it makes you cough and you quickly can't see. You lose control of the car and slam on the brakes, but you can feel yourself going off the road. As the smoke finally clears up inside of your car, you can see the moon. It's at this moment that you realize you're no longer right side up as the car flips and tumbles through the air. You open your eyes to find that you're still buckled into your seat. You release the seatbelt and drop to the roof of the car. You crawl out to find that your car slid to a stop upside down several meters from the road. You look around and far off in the distance, you can see it. The semi that ran you off the road, driving at an almost impossible rate of speed off into the night. You look back at your car, which is completely totaled, and wonder what you're going to do now. It's late the next morning when you finally get back home. The police did not seem to believe your story about the magically appearing semi truck causing your single car accident, but they did at least give you a ride back home after administering a sobriety test. You enter your small studio apartment, and look around at the sparsely decorated room, wondering how you're going to pay rent next month if you can't get to your job. You go to the fridge and open the door, but there's nothing inside except for a carton of milk that's well past its expiration date. You open it and take a whiff, but this is too far gone even for your state of desperation. You close the fridge and lean on the door, trying to figure out what you're going to do. You're so deep in thought that you barely notice the mail being pushed through the slot in your door. You decide to go pick it up even though you know it will only be bad news. And you were right. Bills, bills, and more bills. First, second, and final notices. You wonder if you've ever had a piece of good news show up through that slot in your door. 
What's this, though? The last piece of mail is a battered and folded envelope that looks like it's been used and repurposed many times. It feels thick and heavy, but there's no information on it at all. It's completely blank. You open the envelope, and your eyes light up. Inside is money. It's a stack of crinkled old bills, different denominations, all in a random order, but there's a lot of them. There must be over a thousand dollars here. And there's something else, too. A note. You unfold the creased and dirty piece of paper to see a simple message that looks like it was hastily written in black crayon. All the note says is, Sorry about last night. Hope this helps, compadre. You flip the note over and look in the envelope again, but there's nothing else other than the wad of cash. The apology note may have been unsigned, but you weren't the first to receive something like it, and you would be far from the last. The SCP Foundation, though, knows exactly who sent it. This was a message from SCP-3899, also known as the Night Hauler. SCP-3899 is a black Peterbilt 379 semi-trailer truck with an attached trailer, but as you no doubt have determined, this is no ordinary truck. SCP-3899 has the anomalous effect of appearing seemingly at random upon stretches of highway within the continental United States and usually at a considerable distance away from any other motorists. The truck will manifest already in motion, traveling within roughly 3 kilometers per hour of the posted speed limit, but it will not stay at this speed. Once SCP-3899 has appeared, it will almost immediately begin accelerating, and the speeds it can reach are truly staggering. Despite appearing to be a normal truck, SCP-3899 is able to reach impossibly fast speeds, and it's been observed traveling at over 420 kilometers per hour, or 267 miles per hour. As SCP-3899 flies down the road, it will attempt to avoid other vehicles and roadside objects, and has even been shown the ability to displace itself across short distances, which it seems to mostly do in order to avoid collisions with vehicles. SCP-3899 will disappear and then immediately appear somewhere else, though always within 300 meters of its last location. This reappearance will be accompanied by a thick cloud of dense black smoke that lab tests have revealed to consist of a mixture of diesel fuel combustion byproducts, volcanic ash, and trace amounts of unidentified human blood. The anomalous truck will only appear at night and will demanifest completely once it encounters direct sunlight or if it causes an automotive accident which it has done plenty of times. In one particular incident, undercover SCP Foundation agents working within the Virginia State Department of Transportation became aware of reports of a large black truck appearing on a particular stretch of interstate that had caused multiple accidents. They were able to track down and locate one of the victims of these incidents, a woman named Martha Lewis, who they soon brought in for questioning under the guise of it being a police investigation. The agents questioned Martha on her experience, and she explained her own interaction with the black semi. She said, It's all still clear in my head. I'm driving down I-64 on my way home and the sun had just gone down. There's no other cars and I'm about to take my exit when out of nowhere this huge truck just appears right next to me. There was a bunch of smoke, like it was on fire or something, and the sound was like a bolt of lightning had just struck right next to me. It all happened so fast. All the smoke clouded my windshield and before I could really process what was happening, I was plowing right through a concrete divider and into some trees. I think I passed out. When I came to, there were paramedics and cops. They took me to the hospital. The agents asked if anything happened after that, and she said there was one other odd thing. When she left the hospital and went home, there was a letter waiting for her, but it didn't have a return address. Inside was a large amount of US currency in a random assortment of denominations, with many of the bills appearing wrinkled and worn. There was a note in the envelope too, which read, I'm sorry, didn't mean no harm, for the damages, get y'all a new rig and drive on. Later foundation analysis of the document revealed that the note was written with a piece of charcoal on non-anomalous notebook paper. Now you're probably asking yourself the same question that the SCP researchers had. Just who is the driver of SCP-3899 that apparently wrote this odd note and also paid for the damages they caused? The operator of the truck, which has been designated as SCP-3899-1, is a very mysterious figure. Observers who have been able to get a brief glimpse inside of the truck as it moves past them at a rapid speed have described the driver as looking only like a silhouette of a slightly overweight male wearing the type of headwear that is typically referred to as a trucker hat. Some reports have also alluded to the presence of what appears to be smoky, tentacle-like appendages within the cab, 
though all further efforts to determine the exact physical characteristics of 3899-1 have failed, as the truck has proved resistant to any kind of outside scanning equipment. Most of what is known about the driver has come in the form of direct communication, though not in the form of interviews or any other sort of face-to-face -face interaction. No, while SCP-3899-1 has never been willing to stop and have a discussion with Foundation agents, it does seem more than willing to speak with anyone and everyone in its immediate vicinity over Citizens Band, or CB Radio, which is a type of shortwave person-to-person -person communication system that is popular with many long-haul truckers. In one particular instance, an SCP Foundation helicopter happened to be traveling above a stretch of road where SCP-3899 appeared. An agent within the helicopter began communicating with the anomalous trucker, first asking for their call sign, to which SCP-3899-1 replied, I'm a night owl and I'm coming in hot. I know y'all can feel this speed. After adjusting their volume to compensate for 3899-1's loud response, the agent asked if the entity could explain where they came from. 3899-1 answered with, I roll with the wind. My wheels sing sweet love to the blacktop. I'm filling y'all's veins with road salt and exhaust and the smell of burning rubber. Ain't no bother where I'm from. We all gotta live for the ride and die for nothing. I see, the agent responded before asking, Are you hauling anything in particular? SCP-3899-1 came back with, Ain't you listening, girl? You seeing this? What I got is pure rattling salvation. Eighteen wheels at a time. When y'all's roads is choked, when the ways is blocked and y'all's speed is all dead and gone. I'm dropping this load and we'll all be drinking gas and breathing smoke. The agent didn't understand, though, and asked again who they were and what they wanted. 3899-1 replied, This is for the souls of the road, for the long nights and dead engines, and everyone trying to put that horizon under their wheels. I am the roar of hot iron. I am screaming freedom. I am the death of all barriers. This rig ain't got no quit, honey. I do not stop. Can you feel the rumble? Can you see the fire and smell the burn? I know you can. I can taste your heart and I know you want to fly apart with me. When the agent began to answer in the affirmative that they could indeed, quote, feel the rumble, seemingly caught up in the excitement of SCP-3899-1's proclamation, the investigation was quickly halted and the helicopter broke off from its pursuit. Following this incident, the potential mimetic influence of communicating with 3899-1 is under investigation. SCP-3899, being currently uncontainable by any conventional means, has been classified as Keter. Upon reports of it manifesting, all CB radio transmissions emanating from the truck are monitored by nearby Foundation listening posts for attempted contact by SCP-3899 to civilian recipients. Any individuals who are contacted are to be administered Class B amnestics, as are any eyewitnesses of the truck itself. All information about SCP-3899 is to be suppressed, and a disinformation campaign is active to make all reports of a mysterious truck that can appear out of nowhere and move at impossible speeds seem like nothing more than an urban legend. Just what is SCP-3899? Is the driver some sort of anomalous ghost, or perhaps an old, eldritch god, a manifestation of freedom and perpetual motion given physical form as a diesel-powered behemoth on the highway? Perhaps the answer to that question is up to you. A young man steps off the subway into the station. Like many others on their daily commute, he has headphones on and keeps his eyes glued to his phone as he messages his friends, plays mobile games, and watches videos. He takes the escalator up and out of the subway station, paying no mind to the rats that scurry past down the handrail. He steps out onto the street, head still never looking up from his phone. He's made the same trip hundreds, if not thousands of times, each step of his route home so burned into his mind that he could make this journey blindfolded. He turns a corner when, suddenly, he looks up. There's something different. In the split second before everything goes wrong, he realizes what it is. The grate he has stepped onto has just given way. The young man screams as he falls through the loose drainage grate in the sidewalk and is swallowed up into the bowels of the city. He is in the air for only moments before landing with a thud in the darkness below. The air is knocked out of him, but he's immediately aware that he didn't hit the ground as hard as he could have. Something must have broken his fall. It's too dark to see anything, though. He feels around for his phone. It must be around here somewhere. There, he's got it. The screen is cracked, but luckily, it still works. He turns on the flashlight and looks around. He appears to be in some kind of maintenance area below the sidewalk. The room is mostly empty. So what did he land on? He sits up 
and looks beneath him to find rats, a huge pile of rats. The young man screams and hops up as the rats squeak and scatter. He's in a panic, looking for a way to get out of here as quickly as possible, when he spots something else. There's a pile of dirty clothes in the corner of the room, or at least he hopes it's a pile of dirty clothes. He slowly steps towards whatever it is. Even after his own harrowing ordeal, he still feels compelled to check it out. If he just found a body, the police will need to know, and he might even get his name in the paper. He can see the headline now. Local man finds missing heiress after heroically plunging into city's depths, inherits her millions for some reason. As he steps closer, he notices a cloud of gnats and flies buzzing around the pile. He slaps at his neck, killing some kind of biting fly. He's standing right next to the pile, but he still can't tell if this is a person or not. Hello? Are you okay? The young man asks. No response. He nudges the pile with his foot and jumps back. Did he feel something move? He sticks out his foot and nudges it again. The pile definitely moves this time. A man rolls over, his face covered in bug bites. He's moaning and reaching out, unable to see from his blind eyes that look like they have been gnawed out by rats. He opens his mouth and with one last gasp, appears to die right in front of the young man. The young man can only watch, frozen in fear, as a rat wriggles its way out of his open mouth and stares at the young man. The young man screams, turns, and runs. He doesn't know where he's going as he runs through the dark tunnels, but he finds a set of stairs and follows them up before bursting out of a door into the open air. He slams the door behind him. He's sure the man he saw in the tunnels died, but he's not taking any chances. He runs the rest of the way home, taking the stairs up to his apartment two at a time. He gets into his home and locks and bolts the door behind him. He leans against the door and tries to catch his breath, letting himself slide down to the floor. Finally, safe at last. He slaps at his neck again. Another fly. It must have been in his coat. He takes off his jacket and shirt, shaking them out, and is surprised to see more flies come out, but also other bugs like worms and cockroaches. He keeps shaking, panicking now, as more and more bugs fall from his clothes. He can see in the mirror on the wall that his body is covered in bites, but that's not what really has his attention. He gets close to the mirror, almost in a daze. This can't be right. He must be hallucinating. He looks in the mirror, reaches into his nose, and pulls out a cockroach. Flies crawl out of his mouth as he opens his mouth to scream, while behind him, rats start squeezing in under his door and crawling up his body until he is completely covered in a living, writhing mass of vermin. Many of the anomalies studied by the SCP Foundation are cruel, horrific, and utterly mysterious. And this is one of the rare cases that embodies all three. Because this is SCP-027, also known as the Vermin God. SCP-027 is a phenomenon with strange and frightening properties that seems to affect one human subject at a time. When someone becomes a host to this anomaly, they will find that they are constantly surrounded by swarms of various types of vermin, parasites, and other pests. The human host has no ability to control or command these creatures, and in fact, the animals will often show aggression towards the host, biting and scratching at them as well as any other person who comes near. It is unknown what causes this effect, but once someone has become a host to SCP-027, the effect appears to be permanent. The swarms of vermin that follow the host do not appear instantly, and instead, tend to follow the same pattern of showing up in waves. First, swarms of flying insects, including gnats and flies, will begin to form a cloud around the unlucky individual. Next, non-flying creatures such as lice, cockroaches, worms, spiders, and rats will begin to crawl on the host. The more time that passes, the more of all of these that will appear. Should the host try to leave the location, some of the pests will attempt to cling to them or follow behind, but many of the others will disperse. As soon as the host stops again, though, the process will repeat, and they will once again soon be surrounded by bugs and rodents. While there is no way for a host to rid themselves of the SCP-027 anomaly, the phenomenon has been known to be transferred to a new host, but only following the death of the first. It appears that 027 will continue to jump from host to host, and has likely done this many times in the past. Preliminary research into just how long SCP-027 has existed is ongoing, but early signs point to it having existed for potentially hundreds of years. 
SCP-027 was first identified by the Foundation when, in the 1990s, a male in his late 30s was found in an abandoned warehouse that was completely overrun with rats and insects. The man was filthy, malnourished, and covered in bites and scratches from a variety of pests. He also showed symptoms of deteriorating mental health, likely caused by a combination of heavy substance abuse and sleep deprivation, neither of which were unexpected, given his horrendous circumstances. The anomalous properties of the subject were quickly recognized by field agents, and he was brought to an SCP Foundation site, where he unfortunately died while still under observation. An autopsy later revealed that over 70% of the man's body at the time of death consisted of a colony of rats that had nested in his abdomen and had been living there long enough to produce at least several generations of offspring. Around six days after the man's death, a Foundation security officer at the site where the man had been held reported to medical staff that he was experiencing breathing issues. He told them they began after he had been woken up by what he thought was a housefly crawling up his nose, and he did remember the fly coming back out. Later investigations would reveal that this statement was true, and that the fly laid a clutch of eggs in his sinus cavity as well. The security officer was placed under observation, and following the appearance of more types of vermin, he was classified as SCP-02702. The man who died was then reclassified as SCP-02701, and SCP-027 was redefined as an anomalous effect rather than one individual. It is still unknown just how SCP-027 attracts animals or why it chooses the ones it does to summon to its location. Neither SCP-02701 or 02 have expressed any communication with any kind of entity or the feeling that one was present, and were unable to provide any additional information on the mysterious qualities of the anomaly. In an interview that took place not long after the security officer was identified as a host and placed into containment, he only described feeling dirty and itchy, like he needed a shower. He was deeply frightened by what was happening, and expressed the desire to rid himself of the anomalous effect as soon as possible so that he could rejoin his family. Research into the anomaly continues, but analysis of the current host has been inconclusive at best. The lack of understanding about just what SCP-027 is, how its anomalous effect functions, and how it jumps to a new host has led the SCP Foundation to classify it as Euclid. The current host for the anomaly is being held in a 5 by 5 meter cell with a raised graded floor that is connected to a strong vacuum system to trap any vermin that appear. Any creatures that are removed from the cell are to be incinerated, except for a small portion which are sent to research teams for analysis, though so far, all animals have appeared to be completely non-anomalous in nature. SCP-02702 is to be monitored by at least two Foundation personnel at all times, and in the event that the subject exhibits any odd behavior or an unexpected species of animal is discovered in the cell, it is to be reported to a level 4 personnel immediately. Security personnel assigned to 027 duty are to be vaccinated against all possible animal-borne diseases and have permission to subdue the subject with tranquilizers should the need arise. Should the subject appear to be experiencing a serious medical event, all high-value personnel should be moved far away from the current host to lower the chance of them becoming a host to the anomaly, and no personnel of level 4 clearance or higher should approach within 200 meters of the subject at all until SCP-027 and its strange properties are better understood. A woman runs through a house, screaming and crying for help. She looks behind her and catches a glimpse of a shadowy figure in the next room, and it's coming towards her. She screams again and runs in the only direction she can to get away from it, up the stairs. She runs into the bathroom at the top of the stairs and locks the door behind her. She is breathing heavy as she quickly takes stock of her situation. There's a window, but it's much too small for her to fit through, and even if she could, she'd probably break her neck trying to drop to the ground below. There's no way out. She's trapped. But she has an idea. She takes a deep breath, giving herself a brief moment to gather her courage before she unlocks the door and opens it. She steps onto the landing and spots what she's looking for, a telephone on a small table. But then she also sees the shadow of the thing chasing her coming up the stairs. She runs to the phone and picks it up before running back into the bathroom again. She shuts the door behind her and starts dialing 911, but just as she's about to dial the last number, the phone is ripped out of her hands and slams against the door. She runs to pick it up again, but when she does, she finds that the cord has been cut. There's got to be something else she can try. She rushes to the medicine cabinet and starts searching for anything she can that might help her. 
She frantically looks for something, anything, but is startled by a loud noise. She turns to see the door bulging on its hinges again and again. Her pursuer is trying to kick it down. She goes back to searching the medicine cabinet. There must be something she can use. The woman closes the medicine cabinet, and for a second, time seems to stop. She stares at herself in the mirror, a look of confusion on her face. She mouths the words, help me, to herself in the mirror. The door suddenly bursts off the frame and slams to the floor. The woman spins around holding the only thing she could find, a toothbrush. Her pursuer steps through the now empty doorway. He's a large, terrifying looking man with wild yet focused eyes, and he's holding the biggest knife she's ever seen. The man approaches and the woman cowers in fear. He pauses for just a moment, admiring himself in the medicine cabinet mirror and smiling, seemingly very happy with how this entire scene has unfolded. The man then raises the knife above him as the woman holds up the toothbrush as if it will somehow protect her, but it can't, and the man brings down the knife again and again and again. This murder may have occurred over 40 years ago, but its memory is more alive than you might think. Sometimes what happened in the past doesn't stay there and finds a way to repeat itself again and again and again. Though maybe not in the way that you expect. So join me, Dr. Bob, and find out exactly why SCP-987 is known to the SCP Foundation as the Gruesome Gallery. SCP-987 is a collection of 13 different wall-mounted mirrors of varying shapes and sizes, which have been designated as SCP-987-A through M. Over half of the collection consists of medicine cabinets, but the others range in size from small makeup mirrors to full-length mirrors, with the largest measuring one by one and a half meters. The aesthetic style and materials used indicate that all the mirrors were produced between the 1940s and the 1990s, and there's nothing about their construction or immediate appearance that would give the impression that they are anomalous at all. Photos and video of the mirrors also show them to be perfectly normal mirrors, with the surfaces reflecting exactly as you would expect. In all, it appears at first glance that these are completely normal mirrors, though more in-depth research into the mirrors has been made difficult. You'll see why later. SCP-987 mirrors will finally reveal their strange and unnerving characteristics when a person stands directly in front of them and looks at their surface. When they do, they won't see their reflection as they expected, but an image of a completely different place. It was theorized by researchers that these locations being shown were the mirror's previous location, and research into the origins of the mirrors have revealed the original locations of mirrors C, K, and M, which confirmed this theory to be true. But the mirrors don't just show a static location. When someone looks directly into the mirror, they will see an entire scene play out one that always depicts someone's extremely violent and or gruesome death. Each mirror depicts a different scene and location, though most of them appear to take place in a bathroom of some kind. The scenes shown vary in length, with the shortest being just 48 seconds and the longest running for over four minutes. After the scene finishes, it will simply start again, like a video that has been set on repeat. But the strange qualities of SCP-987 don't stop there. After the video loops and repeats itself twice, the images will start to change. The person in the mirror who is about to suffer a horrific death will seem to become aware that someone is watching them through the mirror. They will often begin soundlessly pleading with the viewer to help them, growing more emphatic as the scene evolves. If there is an aggressor present in the scene, they too will sometimes seem to become aware that they are being watched through the mirror, and may even appear to interact with the person who is watching them by making hostile gestures or writing on the surface of the mirror. Three of the victims portrayed on the glass of SCP-987 mirrors have been identified, the previously mentioned SCP-987-C, K, and M mirrors. SCP-987-C depicts a well-to-do 62-year-old male in the bathroom of his California home in 1968. The man is bound and kneeling on the floor when a young Asian woman dressed in lingerie enters the room and proceeds to strangle the man to death. The scene will repeat one time and then begin to change. In this instance, the woman will usually stop at the mirror after she enters the room to reapply her lipstick. She will then kiss the mirror, leaving a red imprint on the glass before asphyxiating the man on the floor. When looking into SCP-987-K, the viewer will see a 34-year-old man in the hallway of his home which has been identified as being in Maine during the early 2000s. The man is standing on a ladder while he installs a new chandelier in the ceiling. 
After a moment, the man loses his balance and becomes entangled in the elaborate lighting fixture. As he struggles to compose himself, he accidentally pulls a length of electrical wire from the ceiling that becomes wrapped around the man's neck as he falls from the ladder, leading to him being simultaneously strangled and electrocuted. When the scene repeats and starts to change, the man will appear to become more and more apprehensive about his task, and his final moments will become more and more painful looking. His wife will sometimes enter as well to find his dead body suspended from the ceiling before the scene ends and starts to repeat. SCP-987-M shows a 20-year-old woman in the bathroom of a hotel room in New York City in 1978. The woman is seen to be reacting to an aggressor who was outside the view offered by the mirror. The woman looks afraid and will try to run out of the room, but a man in a denim jacket rushes the woman, stabs her in the abdomen with a knife, and flees. The woman falls to the ground and dies almost instantly. When it repeats for the third time, the woman will attempt to communicate with the viewer prior to the aggressor entering the scene, but she will appear inebriated and will struggle to communicate clearly. If SCP-987 was simply a collection of mirrors that displayed the final moments of individuals and changed on repeat viewings in odd and frightening ways, that would be strange enough. But there's even more to this bizarre SCP. In addition to the mirrors is SCP-9871, commonly referred to within the Foundation as the Curator. SCP-9871 is an invisible entity, visible only to heat-sensitive cameras that takes up roughly the space of a two-meter tall person. The area it occupies is endothermic, meaning it drains the heat from nearby objects, in this instance, from ones that are roughly one to two meters away. It has also demonstrated the ability to manipulate objects up to eight meters away that weigh as much as 150 kilograms. SCP-9871's primary behavior is to move along the ground, going from mirror to mirror in an apparently random pattern. It stops in front of each mirror for roughly 30 minutes before moving on to the next. It only engages in this behavior when alone, though, and if anyone is present, it will maintain at least a three-meter distance from them at all times. The only exceptions to this occurred when staff attempted to do anything to the mirrors other than gently clean them. If the mirrors are tampered with in any way, SCP-9871 will react quickly and aggressively, making any physical research into the mirrors difficult, if not impossible. Both SCP-9871, as well as the collection of all 13 mirrors, have been classified as Euclid, and are currently contained at Research Site 14 in an airtight 5 by 12 by 3 meter chamber with concrete walls that is itself enclosed in a Faraday cage. The chamber is monitored at all times by both standard and thermographic cameras, but despite this, there have been several instances of SCP-9871 seeming to breach containment and disappear for short periods of time before reappearing in the containment cell. On at least five known occasions, SCP-9871 dissipated from both the normal and thermal imaging cameras. In each of these instances, when it reappeared, a new mirror materialized as well, which has led to the Foundation's original collection of 13 mirrors growing to 18 in total, and it seems likely that this number may continue to increase. While in most cases, SCP-9871 returns with a mirror that depicts a death that occurred long in the past, in one especially chilling instance, the 9871 entity disappeared a full 15 minutes before the death took place. When it returned, it had the mirror depicting the freak accident death of a man being killed by his own chandelier. Whether SCP-9871 had any hand in this death, or perhaps even all of the deaths, is currently unknown. What does seem likely? is that the presence of the mirrors in Foundation control is the only thing that keeps SCP-9871 in containment, at least most of the time. But be careful the next time you're performing a dangerous task and notice that a mirror is in view. You never know who, or what, may be watching. A man is lying in a hospital bed, and it is clear that he is not doing well. A group of doctors buzz around him performing various tests, checking his vital signs again and again. The man feels weak and a little disoriented, and the looks on the various doctors' faces tells him all he needs to know. Something is very wrong with him. Finally, there is a break in the commotion, and the doctors stop prodding at him and peering into his eyes with a bright, blinding light. All of the doctors and nurses leave the room except for one. The doctor steps towards the man and tells him that he has some bad news. You see, before the doctor can finish, Someone else emerges from the shadows in the corner of the room and taps him on the shoulder. I'll handle this. 
The man hadn't noticed this person, but he can see now that he's dressed in a suit and, unlike the doctors, he doesn't have any identifying items like a name tag or badge. Maybe he's some kind of professor, or a renowned surgeon who is going to tell him how they will make him better. The doctor steps back from the bed, but the man in the suit tells the doctor that it would be best if he and the patient could be left alone. Just for a moment, of course. The doctor nods in agreement and leaves the room. The man in the suit waits until the door is closed behind him to continue. He tells the sick man that he has a rare condition, quite rare. So rare, in fact, that you're the only person to ever have it, the only recorded case in history. The man in the suit sits down on the bed next to the man and takes his hand, lifting it up, examining it. The man's hand is an odd color. It has a slight green tint to it, and the skin itself appears to be taking on a fibrous quality. The sick man feels very tired, but he manages to whisper, Are you a doctor? Are you going to help me? The man in the suit responds, Yes, I'm a doctor. Of sorts. A doctor and a researcher. I work for a very important organization, and I specialize in cases just like yours. Well, not exactly like yours. You're unique. Quite special, in fact. The sick man <laughs> offers a weak smile. I'm very lucky. Oh yes, very lucky indeed. Well, not because of your condition, of course, but because I am here. You see, if it's all right with you, we'd like for you to come with us, to come stay at one of our facilities for a while. We can't promise that we'll be able to figure out exactly what's happening or why. But if we can, we have a much better chance of figuring out how to cure it. To cure you, so you can go back to a normal life. Do I have much of a choice? The sick man asks. Of course you do. It's completely up to you. I think this would be your best course of action, your best by far, in fact, but we can't force you to do anything you don't want to do. The sick man looks down at his greenish hand again, turning it over in front of his face, examining the small growths that seem to be sprouting from his skin. When do we leave? Right now, the man in the suit tells him. The nurses will come get you ready, and then we'll be on our way. The man in the suit leaves the room and closes the door behind him. Standing next to the door in the hallway are a pair of men wearing tactical uniforms like a SWAT team. The man in the suit tells them that luckily they won't be needed today. This one is coming easy. The sick man lies on a bed, but now he is in a new room. This one is even more sterile than the hospital, with cold concrete walls and harsh fluorescent lights. Just like in the hospital, he's surrounded by a seemingly never-ending cast of doctors, nurses, and researchers. They too poke and prod at him, take samples, and administer all kinds of tests. As time goes on, the man's condition only grows worse. It seems there's nothing that they can do to stop his condition from advancing. The green color spreads across his body and his skin soon becomes woody and stiff. If he sits in one place for too long without moving, tiny fibers emerge from his skin like probing roots looking for soil. All the while, the man grows weaker and more fragile. Even the slightest movement seems to cause him great pain. The doctor who originally brought the man to the facility gathers with a small group in the observation room next to the man's containment cell. They discuss the results of a recent test, which showed that much of the melanin in his skin has somehow been replaced with chlorophyll, and that the fibrous quality of his skin is being caused by the appearance of cellulose around his cells. In other words, he isn't just starting to look like a plant, he's truly becoming a plant, and there doesn't seem to be anything they can do to stop it. Try as they might, they haven't found a single clue as to what is causing the man's condition, or how to treat it. The man, though, seems strangely at peace with his fate. He's told that they're going to allow him to live, whether that be as a man or as a plant in containment, for as long as he can stay alive, and that he will be well taken care of to make the whole process as comfortable for him as possible. Even though they failed to find a cure for his anomalous disease, they will do everything in their power to make sure he doesn't suffer. A tragic yet familiar tale for the SCP Foundation, a normal person is subjected to an abnormal situation that completely changes their life, and not for the better. At least in this situation, the Foundation appears to have shown a rare glimpse of their own humanity, opting to make this safe class anomaly's existence as painless as possible, rather than force it to endure a lifetime of painful tests and studies. Or at least that's what you've been led to believe. Unfortunately, everything you've just seen about SCP-1500 is a lie. Those with level 3 clearance, though, can learn the truth, which is that SCP-1500 is actually an extremely dangerous anomaly, whose true identity must be hidden from even the majority of the Foundation, for reasons you'll soon learn. SCP-1500 is not a man suffering from a condition that causes him to slowly transform into a plant-like being, but is actually a greenish-gray, smooth-skinned humanoid with no facial features at all. 
Its limbs are long and multi-jointed, and its abdomen is highly distended. The skin is exceptionally durable and tough, and though SCP-1500 has no visible sense organs like ears or a nose, it still appears to possess senses that are roughly equivalent to an average human's. The entity is incapable of speech, owing to its lack of a mouth, and it has not shown a need to eat, breathe, or sleep at all. In addition to the strange appearance of SCP-1500, its primary anomalous effect is the impact it has on any human that comes within its line of sight, or rather what would be its line of sight if it had any eyes. Those that do find that they will soon begin experiencing headaches, nausea, and an overwhelming sense of dread. These symptoms will increase over the next several minutes, with the headaches becoming more and more debilitating, and the feelings of nausea and fear growing until eventually the subject passes out. They will remain unconscious for roughly 15 seconds, after which they will awaken and claim to have no memory of ever being exposed to SCP-1500. But something else strange also happens to the subject after waking. When asked to describe the creature known as SCP-1500, they will no longer remark on its faceless head or long twisted limbs. Instead, they will describe the creature as being an average looking Caucasian male. Even stranger is that to them, it now has a name, Zachary Callahan. In further interviews with subjects exposed to SCP-1500, it became clear that many of their memories had been reshaped to now include the entity in its human-looking Zachary Callahan form. They would often describe him as a close friend from childhood or early adulthood, and one that played a significant role in their lives. They also claim that they are perfectly capable of communicating with Zachary Callahan, able to carry on conversations with him, while all the observing researchers will see is an apparently one-sided conversation between the subject and the featureless gray-skinned creature. While Foundation personnel have found that they are able to remove the false memories from the subject's minds through the use of amnestics, they have yet to be able to reverse the effect that causes the subject to see SCP-1500 as a human being, and everyone who has been exposed continues to see the entity as Zachary Callahan forevermore. It is still unknown what kind of long-term effects this exposure may have or how dangerous to their mental or physical health it will turn out to be. Even more concerning is that evidence has emerged that SCP-1500 may be able to affect more than just those in its immediate presence. Recently, a United States Senator was giving a televised speech on a rather uninteresting topic. The speech started out normal enough, but then the Senator began to relay an anecdote about a childhood fishing trip he had taken with a friend. You won't be surprised to learn that according to the senator, the friend's name was none other than Zachary Callahan. Investigations into the senator's background concluded that there was no person by that name of the appropriate age in the area where he grew up. It was also discovered the senator had suffered an especially bad migraine at a dinner party the week before the speech. Further research into SCP-1500's memory-altering effects have also revealed that they might just be more intrusive than first believed. Rather than simply appearing as an old friend, Subjects exposed to 1500 have begun to report that Zachary Callahan actually played a much more prominent role in their lives, either as a close relative, a parental figure, or even a former lover. In each of these cases, the subjects described their feelings for Zachary Callahan as ones of adoration and that he made them feel protected and loved. Most troubling of all is a recent addendum to the SCP-1500 file, which describes the very latest research on the anomaly and its effects. It is now estimated that as many as 23,000 people all across the world have been affected by the creature, with the idea of Zachary Callahan implanted into their memories. It is unknown why it is trying to spread its influence so far and wide, but one clue that may point to a nefarious purpose is that it seems to be disproportionately targeting political and military figures, as well as SCP Foundation personnel. Following these new developments, classification of SCP-1500 to Keter was requested and granted. Due to the risk that SCP-1500 poses through its anomalous effects and its powerful ability to influence those in positions of great power, it is permanently kept in a modified humanoid containment cell at Site-17. No personnel are allowed to enter into its containment chamber under any circumstances, nor are there security cameras in its cell. A false containment document describing a human male with an anomalous plant-like effect was placed in the database in order to deter further investigation into the real SCP-1500. And any personnel who experience painful, persistent headaches are immediately transferred away from Site-17, while any who attempt to breach containment are immediately terminated. Is SCP-1500 planting the seeds for something big by infiltrating the minds of some of the most influential people on Earth? 
Or is it merely looking for a connection as it takes on a form that it wishes it could have in the only way it can, inside an imagination? Perhaps one day, we will know the answer. First of all, let's get one thing straight. He had never wanted to be a police officer. All the way through school, while the other boys were playing Guardi e Ladri, or Cops and Robbers in English, he had been inside reading. Forget playing games about criminals and pretending you're in a 50s movie. The man had always been obsessed with all things ancient, artifacts and archaeology. That was where his imagination lived. And yet now, he is one of them, a police officer, standing in a sweltering uniform under the baking Italian sun, staring at fishing boats through a pair of binoculars. Just get a degree in Latin and move to Rome, you'll be a historian in no time. What could be easier? Yeah, right. After two years of job searching, he'd given up. The police were hiring and said they liked the look of him. What they'd failed to explain was that he'd be trained in the Polizia Provinciale. His primary duties? Enforcing regional fishing laws. The man sighs and lowers his binoculars. The job wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the uniform. Who was Il Genio who thought that a black uniform would be a good idea in this heat? The police officer's walkie-talkie crackles. Someone's requesting him specifically. He doesn't recognize the voice. Must be a mistake or another prank. He's definitely running out of patience for those. It is his job, though. He pushes the button down and responds. Reports of a dangerous individual wandering around in central Rome, near the Colosseum, threatening members of the public and acting erratically. The police officer replies, checking they've got the right person. What's this got to do with fishing law? He isn't even in Rome right now. It'll take him almost an hour to drive back to the city. There's a pause from the other end, then the voice crackles back through. You speak Latin, right? It was only a little thing, but it annoys the police officer for the whole drive back to Rome, his beat-up hatchback winding its way through the traffic with a siren blaring. You don't speak Latin. No one speaks it. It's a dead language. You study it, you read it, you can write it, you can speak it if you want, but no one speaks Latin like they speak Italian. Nice to use the siren for once, though. But sure enough, as he pulls up the handbrake, parking down a crowded side street, thank God for Polizia parking privileges, the voice he can hear yelling from nearby does appear to be speaking in Latin. The man must be very agitated. The officer can hear the shouts quite clearly even through his rolled-up windows. It doesn't take long at all to locate the disturbance. Polizia vehicles, much shinier and bigger than his own, block off the entrance to the square. Officers with colorful berets stand shoulder to shoulder, blocking off members of the public and tourists who all swarm close, trying to get an eye on the commotion. The police officer wearily pushes his way through the throng. The officers blocking the way smirk at his uniform and point at his car parked down the road. The longer he tries to persuade them to let him through, the more he feels like he's being pranked. Until suddenly, a senior officer with an even more colorful beret appears behind them and barks for them to let him through. The constable leads the police officer through the row of cars and into the square. It's mostly deserted. A few officers armed with tasers stand nervously in front of the various cafes and gelaterias. But everyone has eyes only for the man in the middle of the square. Brandishing a shovel, the man is yelling at the top of his voice. He swings it wildly at any little movement, and every few seconds looks down at his body in a state of total confusion. His face contorts constantly, fluctuating between savagery and utter fear. What is most strange about this man, however, is what is sitting on his head, an ancient Roman centurion's helmet. The police officer recognizes the helmet almost straight away. He remembers it from one of his textbooks at university. It looks to be one from the Marian reforms, roughly 100 years BCE. Go on, talk to him, the constable hisses in the police officer's ear. He's speaking Latin, isn't he? Speak to him. Sure enough, the crazed man is speaking Latin. His accent is rough, but totally natural. The words flow from his mouth as if he's been speaking the language all his life. But that wouldn't make sense. No one speaks Latin. The police officer steps forward and clears his throat. A megaphone is shoved into his hand. He raises it to his mouth and speaks into it. Immediately, the crazed man turns towards him and starts brandishing the shovel, wild panic distorting his face. The officer instinctively lowers the megaphone. The man's eyes follow the device. That was clearly a non-starter. The officer slowly lowers it to the ground and raises his hands, palms out to the man. He tries again. His Latin is rusty, very rusty, but he manages to introduce himself. The man's eyes meet his. The shovel stops swinging for a moment. When he speaks, his voice is a notch calmer. Only a notch. Publius Cartifilius Aetius, 
Roman centurion, hero of the Yogurtine War. I serve under the command of the Consul Gaius Marius. The police officer lets out a long breath. This is going to be an interesting day. He isn't sure what kind of drugs this grad student has been taking, but this level of delusion can't have just come from one too many all-nighters in the university library. The officer, hands still raised, holds eye contact with the man. He politely explains that Consul Gaius Marius is not here right now in what must be very formal Latin. That only seems to distress the man. He swings the shovel wildly round again, pointing it at the ruins of the Colosseum standing proudly over him. What has happened to my city? Which barbarous nation is responsible? I will slay every newborn male and have the mother stitch their scalps into a cloak. I shall wear it as I parade the streets of their capital. Maybe slight overkill. It was mostly just a few earthquakes that had toppled the Colosseum. Not entirely sure who he could take that up with. God, maybe? But the Romans had already had a go at slaying his offspring. What is so confusing about this man finally registers with the police officer. Well, aside from the obvious. The man is dressed in modern clothes. He talks like an ancient Roman, brandishes a shovel like a sword, is wearing a centurion's helmet, and yet, from the neck down, he's dressed in khakis and a polo shirt. The police officer asks the man where he's come from this morning. The man looks stumped by the question. The more he thinks about it, the more agitated he seems to become. The officer is about to divert the man's attention when he spies a pair of military police personnel approaching the man from behind, tasers at the ready. The officer cries out a warning, but it's too late. The barbs sink into the man's flesh, and the current flows through him. His muscles seize up, his body convulses, and he collapses to the ground. A sea of dark uniforms descend on him, obscuring him from view. All that can be heard are his screams. Several hours pass before the police officer gets a call back on his walkie-talkie. He spends the afternoon checking in with the station repeatedly about the strange man's situation. Before long, his requests are met with radio silence. But that evening, just as he is finishing up his shift, a call comes through. It is brief and tired sounding, but it tells him what he needs to know. The man is being held in a station nearby. By the time the police officer sits down across from the centurion again, it's clear that the man is exhausted. Bruises cover his arms, his lip is busted, and he has a nasty swelling pushing against the inside of his helmet. Apparently the guards had tried to remove the helmet earlier, but the man had grown so violent that they decided it wasn't worth the effort. Where did you get that helmet? The officer asks, nodding to it. Barracks Commander Quintus Sextus Caiso gave it to me. That wasn't particularly helpful. The officer racks his brains, trying to think of how to get through to this man. He notices the soldier across from him keeps glancing up at the ceiling. He follows the man's eyeline and realizes he must be looking at the fluorescent tube light flickering slightly above them. The soldier is muttering something under his breath about dark magic. The police officer tries to explain that the light is essentially just a different kind of oil lamp. The soldier snorts derisively. He knows a cursed object when he sees it. Cursed object? The police officer studies the helmet more closely. It can't be a replica. There's no way. The nicks on the sides, the rusting around the edges, the oxidation of the bronze elements. It looks utterly authentic to what a 100 BCE helmet should look like. You've told me where you got your helmet. Where did you get your clothes? The soldier stops grumbling. His jaw clenches slightly. He does not answer for a long time. When he does, his voice has lost some of its bravado from before. These garments are not my own. I awoke wearing them. This body… The officer can piece together the rest of the sentence without the man saying it. This delusion must be running so deep that the man is completely disassociated from his own body. Then, all of a sudden, the soldier starts talking. He talks for several minutes without stopping for breath or interjections. At times his voice swells with pride, at other times it cowers with fear. But he speaks with a clarity and determination that goes beyond delusion. However impossible it may seem, the police officer has no choice but to believe that the man sitting across from him was, in fact, Publius Cartifilius Aetius. He'd fought in the Jugurtine War, a battle which the Romans had won, capturing King Jugurtha. Publius had been one of the centurions tasked with escorting the captured king back to Rome in chains. The soldiers had all drawn lots to determine who'd be on guard duty on which night. Publius had drawn the shortest straw and ended up guarding the king on the last night. The night of the Triumphus. The police officer took a second to remember what the Triumphus was. After a battle, on the final night, the Romans would throw a huge party celebrating their victory. While all of the other soldiers were out drinking and sleeping with the local women, Publius stayed up all night watching the king in silence. 
The king spent the night trying to bribe him, persuade him, flatter him, say anything to try and win his freedom. When nothing worked, the king grew frustrated, then angry. In a spitting rage, he started to curse the centurion. The soldier recounts the curse word for word to the police officer, who sits in stunned silence. A chill comes over the room as he speaks. Spirits of the underworld, I consecrate and hand over to you, if you have any power, Publius Cartifilius Aetius. Whatever he does, may it all turn to ash. Spirits of the netherworld, I consecrate to you his limbs, his head, his shadow, his brain, his mouth, his nose, his speech, his breath, his liver, his heart, his lungs, his intestines, his stomach, his arms, his hands, his knees, his calves, his heels, his toes. Spirits of the netherworld, if I see him wasting away, I swear that I will be delighted to offer a sacrifice to you. A king's sacrifice. Publius punched the king square in the face, but a sense of unease came over him over the coming days. As the king was dragged through the streets of Rome, humiliated publicly and executed, he had remained utterly calm, staring at Publius whenever he had the chance. Desperate to clear his mind, Publius went out drinking with his fellow soldiers. They had a raucous night, feasting, sleeping around, steadily losing consciousness, until Publius passed out in an alleyway. The centurion stops talking. His hands begin to shake, and his face contorts again. The police officer waits patiently, but the man does not continue his story. A single tear streams down the man's cheek, followed by a second on the other side. Then suddenly, both eyes are streaming, and he is shaking uncontrollably. A guttural cry fills the room. The police officer reaches across the table to take the soldier's hand. It's the wrong move. The soldier jerks back away from him, straining at the handcuffs holding him to the table. Panic fills his face again, the same panic that had torn at his face in the square earlier that day. He lunges for the police officer to attack him. At that moment, the door bursts open and a group of men charge in, restraining the soldier. They push the police officer back so hard he falls on the floor. These men aren't dressed in polizia uniforms at all. They're wearing totally unremarkable black suits. One of them removes the helmet from the man's head and shoves it into a containment box with the words SCP Foundation printed on the side. The others restrain the man, but he suddenly stopped resisting. In a daze, the man looks around the room, his face utterly bewildered but harmless. There's no fight left in him, no soldier. The police officer clamors to his feet and approaches the man. Publius, are you okay? The police officer says in Latin. The man stares blankly back at him. Where the hell am I? He says in perfect Italian. That helmet, referred to herein as SCP-1510, now lives in a much more secure box in the artifact containment section of Site-19. In order to prevent the helmet from rusting or undergoing any significant wear, it is kept in a waterless environment. The layer of blue-green oxidized bronze is not to be removed, as it acts as a protective layer for the unoxidized bronze underneath. As the police officer observed, the helmet bears no distinctive features at all that would distinguish it from any other artifact helmets from the same era. The notable exception, of course, being that the helmet is inhabited by the former centurion Publius Cartifilius Aetius, also known as SCP-1510-1. When the helmet is placed on one's head, the wearer's consciousness and body will be taken over by the soldier, who gains total control over their motor functions, thoughts, feelings, everything. However, this effect is not universal. Only males can be affected by SCP-1510 and they have to be aged between 28 and 35. It is theorized that this is to approximate the age and gender of SCP-1510-1 when he was alive in ancient Rome. Historical accounts seem to verify the account that this SCP gives of its life. While there are obviously few records remaining of 107 BCE, those that do exist align with his version of events, and nothing it has reported during interview sessions have seemed historically inaccurate as of yet. Interview sessions are held using D-Class personnel who don the helmet. While no noticeable long-term effects have been observed from wearing the helmet, long-term studies on the health consequences are ongoing. Initial interviews proved futile. SCP-1510-1 was immediately distressed at the point of aggression and violence for the first five sessions, attempting to attack the interviewers and fight its way out of the containment facility. However, upon the commencement of Interview 7, SCP-1510-1 was noticeably calmer. After apologizing for its previous behavior, the SCP was willing and able to share its life story and how it found its way into the head of a grave robber in modern-day Italy. The first part of the story is the same as that told to our police officer earlier. 
the point where SCP-1510-1 grew upset and violent with the police officer, roughly corresponds to the ending of interview log SCP-1510-1-6, where the SCP requested a break to gather its thoughts. The next day, during interview number 7, the SCP told the rest of its story. It awoke in the alleyway after an indeterminate amount of time, still inhabiting the body of Publius Cartophilius Aetius. However, that body was now a corpse, having died in the street from unknown causes, possibly alcohol poisoning, choking on vomit, or a head injury. In a state of distress, SCP-1510-1 was conscious as its body rotted away, fully sentient and aware of everything that was happening as its body deteriorated before its failing eyes. The corpse was soon discovered by a pair of local beggars who, noticing it was still alive, summoned a Haruspex. A Haruspex was a person trained in the art of divination who would study the entrails of deceased animals to find meaning. Upon examining and cutting apart the corpse of Publius Cartophilius Aetius, the Haruspex concluded that the body was marked by the Furies and was a herald of tyranny reborn. The beggars quickly carried the body away and buried it outside of the city in an unused grave. SCP-1510-1 describes the experience that followed as a kind of fading. The helmet remained on the body, but the body deteriorated over time, steadily sapping the SCP of any sensations or stimuli. It appears the helmet needs a host in order to see, hear, smell, taste, and otherwise react or interact with the world. Removed from a host, it enters what it refers to as darkness, a time where it hovers between consciousness and unconsciousness, aware and thinking, but simultaneously resting in a kind of void, unable to observe the world or interact with it. For over 2,000 years, SCP-1510 remained in this state, until a sudden awakening. A grave robber in Italy, the man brandishing a shovel in khakis and polo who ended up sitting confused in the police station, was responsible. Local police interviews reveal that the man has a history of digging around Rome and across Italy, looking for ancient artifacts to sell off to the highest bidder. Upon discovering SCP-1510, this man had proudly put the helmet onto his head, not realizing the effect that it would have on him. Almost instantaneously, the man's body was taken over by SCP-1510-1, who, after centuries of darkness, now suddenly found itself in the bustling heart of Italy's biggest city. Electric lights, smartphones, cars, sirens, tourists, everywhere SCP-1510-1 looked, it saw technology totally alien and otherworldly, overlaid and built into a city it had once known. In a state of utter panic, the SCP grabbed the nearest weapon it could find, the shovel used to excavate it, and started to attack those around it. Not exactly the best wake-up call. Nowadays, however, SCP-1510-1 is highly cooperative, having had time to process the world that it has awoken into and the loss of the world it left behind, it holds on to a soldier-like sense of duty. SCP-1510-1 still worships the ancient Roman gods, and as such, believes earnestly that Jupiter and Juno have a hand in keeping it alive. It has explained to interviewers on multiple occasions that there must be a purpose behind its continued existence, and that it is keen to work with SCP personnel in any way it can so as to achieve that purpose. While still being held in Latin, conversations with SCP-1510-1 are positive and at times jovial. It has a keen memory of its life in ancient Rome and can give very valuable insight into events that occurred at the time. This gives the Foundation vital intelligence in uncovering and tracing the origins of further SCPs that were theorized to have been present during the Yugurtine War in what is present-day Algeria. It's the grisliest crime scene the detective has seen in years. Photographers wince as they capture it all in a succession of quick, stark flashes. CSI technicians do what they can to pick up the broken pieces. Posted at the gate, a rookie doubles over and throws up, while his older partner gives him a sympathetic pat on the back. He can't hide his own discomfort at the things they've seen today. The call came in the middle of the night from a pair of concerned hikers on the outskirts of town. They were halfway through their nightly walk down an old country road when they heard screaming from a nearby farm. When officers finally made their way down to the farmhouse, it was too late. Everyone there was dead. Nobody to save. All that's left to do is pick up the pieces and figure out what the hell actually happened. The detective leans under a yellow garland of crime scene tape and asks an attending officer what they know so far. The cop, who looks pale and clammy, swallows over a lump in his throat and says, Looks like the old farmer snapped and went postal. Whole family's dead. We found his body in the barn. He heads inside to take a look at the carnage. 
It's a veritable house of horrors. The farmer's wife is dead in the kitchen. The children were both murdered in their beds. The detective can't say he's ever seen a murder done in such cold blood, so detached. For a man with no history of violence to do something so terrible to his loved ones for no reason. The detective shakes his head and walks upstairs, sliding on rubber gloves to avoid contaminating the scene. He goes room to room, making fastidious notes about anything suspicious. He's got a keen eye for this kind of thing. The man's a 20-year veteran of the force, he's seen some terrible things. But as he lays his eyes on the bodies of the victims, he can't help but feel a chill tiptoeing down his vertebrae. In the master bedroom, where the now-deceased farmer and his wife once shared a loving marital bed, he hits some pay dirt, a diary in the bedside cabinet. He flips through. Early on, it's all mundane, scattered thoughts for the day at hand and little to-do lists for the next one. But the last three entries contain a marked shift from what came before. The first one reads, he seemed shook up when he came back from the barn today. He's awful quiet about it, said something like, I heard something I shouldn't have. In the barn? Don't know what that could mean, but I decided not to press, stressed enough already. He didn't say much to the kids during dinner, kept looking over his shoulder. Freaked me out something terrible. I don't know what did it, but whatever it was, he put a scare in him. The second reads, I'm starting to worry about him. It's been a few days since whatever he heard in the barn, and he ain't gotten any better. In fact, I think he's getting worse. He won't shower. Something about the bathroom mirror, he just won't go in there. He hasn't been eaten. Worst of all, he doesn't sleep. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and see him sitting bolt upright, staring at the bedroom door, not saying a word, not even blinking. The third and final entry reads, This ain't the man I married anymore. There's something wrong with him. It's scaring the kids and it's scaring me. He started bringing his gun to bed every night. Doesn't sleep, just sits there with it. He never sleeps. When I asked him what's happening, he told me something's coming, but it's okay. He won't let it get us no matter what. I don't understand. I'm gonna take the kids and go stay with mom for a few weeks while he works this out. But I'm afraid of what he'll do if he realizes. The gun is always loaded. The detective sighs and slides the diary into an evidence baggie. It was, sadly, a tale he'd heard all too many times. The terrible things we can do to the ones we love when we're not ourselves. Though it now seems cut and dry, a mental break snowballing into a massacre, one detail is still gnawing at the detective. What did the farmer hear in the barn that day? When the detective enters, he orders everyone else to leave. He needs some time alone in here. As the people file out, he approaches the farmer's corpse. He's laying in the straw, head a bloody mess, bludgeoned beyond recognition. And yet, he's the one holding the blood-stained hammer. And in his other hand, he's clutching something even stranger, a rusty old cowbell. Of all the things to be holding in your last moments on earth, the detective thinks as he reaches over. Something about the bell draws his eye. Why, after murdering his entire family, would a man head out into the barn and presumably, try and fail to hammer a cowbell to pieces. As he picks up the bell, he runs his gloved fingers along the rust. Other than the wear and tear of age, the bell shows no signs of actual damage. It's such a strange, innocuous object. What's the significance? His internal musing is interrupted when a large spider, the kind that like to make their homes in straw-filled barns, suddenly crawls out from inside the bell and onto the detective's hand. He drops the bell, an involuntary shock reflex, and it hits the ground with a brassy gong. The sound lingers in the air for far longer than it should. It seems almost like it's getting louder. The detective feels his heartbeat speeding up, his breaths getting heavy and labored. The sound gets louder. It feels like someone is sitting on his chest. He falls to his knees, scratching at his swelling throat. His heart pounds. Is he having a heart attack? He claws at the dirt and straw beneath him, trying desperately to get a handle on things as the world around him seems to go dark. The toll of the cowbell gets louder and louder. Eventually, he's able to force out a scream and collapses to the ground. When his eyes open, he's being carted away on a stretcher to a nearby ambulance parked just outside the crime scene. When a paramedic asks him if he's okay, the only thing he can stutter out through his dry mouth is, Don't touch the bell. Don't let anyone touch the bell. The doctor who treats him will later tell him there are no signs of any physical ailment. In all likelihood, the detective had experienced a severe anxiety attack, 
When the detective tells the doctor that he has no history of anxiety attacks and that this is far from the first violent crime scene he's encountered, the doctor purses his lips and knits his brow in concentration. Very strange, the doctor says. Perhaps just take it easy for the next few days. Work stress can sneak up on a person, especially in a career as high stakes as yours. It can sometimes manifest in rather strange ways. That night, the detective is at home, brewing himself a soothing cup of herbal tea on his doctor's recommendation. He's still racked by a strange uneasiness from earlier in the day. You see, one of the keys to being a good detective is pattern recognition. You're able to detect obscure links between pieces of information that other people, in the stress of the moment, may not correlate. As the detective sips his tea, he remembers the first entry in the farmer's wife's diary. When the farmer's downward spiral started, it began with him hearing something he shouldn't have inside the barn. The detective doesn't know a lot about what happened to himself in that barn either, but he can safely say he heard something he shouldn't have heard too. He sighs, no point in psyching himself out like this. After all, it's just the post-attack jitters, and turns to his kitchen window, hoping to look out at the night sky and feel a little more at peace. Instead, he sees something out of a nightmare, a tall figure standing behind him, somewhere in the ballpark of human, but also somehow not. It's tall, fleshy, and emaciated. Its face is too smooth, with bulging eyes and a large mouth being the only features. It reaches for him with huge, spindle-fingered hands mere centimeters away from the back of his head. But the second it sees him looking at it, it turns and begins to run. The detective's mug falls and shatters on the ground. He turns with an involuntary yelp to track the creature, but it's already gone. His kitchen is empty and silent. Of course, one question haunts his mind. What the hell just happened? He's no fool. He knows the mind can play funny tricks on you. After all, who hasn't seen something out of the corner of their eye that gave them a momentary fright before realizing that it was just a trick of the imagination? But this wasn't just a flicker playing on a paranoid mind. The detective would swear on his mother's life that he truly saw this thing, some bizarre humanoid monster standing behind him in his reflection. He doesn't know which possibility scares him more, that there really was something behind him, or that he's starting to lose his mind. Either offered a number of frightening possibilities, but the detective does what he does best, applies logic to a situation. He'd spent the day around a particularly distressing crime scene, read something unnerving in the diary of one of the victims, and suffered a panic attack in the barn. All of this was just a suggestion implanted in his mind, connections being threaded where they shouldn't, a natural side effect of a brain wired to register patterns in strange data clusters. The detective does his best to remain calm for the rest of the evening. Fear is the mind killer. Panic only ever makes a situation worse. These are both things he believes, but he can't seem to shake that creeping feeling of dread. He's being watched. For the first time in his adult life, the detective decides he doesn't want to sleep in the dark. All those shapes in the blackness put him on edge. He thinks that a good night's sleep will probably have him right as rain by tomorrow morning. Everything passes eventually. As his mind drifts and his eyes begin to flutter closed, he starts to wonder if he always left that bathroom door open, or whether it started to open very slowly as soon as his head hit the pillow. Sure enough, he wakes up gasping. Long, cold fingers, abnormally long in fact and cold as death, have closed around his throat. He's gasping in vain for breath as the hand clamps tighter. His eyes jolt open and he sees it again, that tall, thin monster lingering over him, strangling him. Its face is split into a wide, sadistic, tooth-bearing grin, or something so thin it's impossibly strong. The detective can't move, he can't scream, he can't do anything. But as he slips from sleep to true wakefulness, the monster is gone. It wafts out of the room with all the ease of a gust of wind. He sits up, heart pounding, lungs strained, skin slick with sweat. He's never been so afraid in his life. He's been calmer during the active shootouts of his beat days all those years ago. The thing that was strangling him, it looked exactly the same as the monster from the reflection. They weren't just similar, it was exactly the same thing. Is he being stalked? Then it dawns on him, another fragment of information swimming in the mess of his consciousness. An article he'd read a couple years before about a phenomenon known as sleep paralysis. It's when people suddenly wake up during REM sleep. Their body remains paralyzed while their consciousness activates, giving them one foot in reality while leaving the other in a nightmare. In this state, people can believe they're being attacked by monsters or demons. And one of the major factors causing sleep paralysis? Stress. The detective sighs. He feels like an idiot. 
There's nothing he's experienced today that doesn't have a completely logical explanation, so why does he keep jumping to such absurd conclusions? Twisting facts to suit theories rather than theories to suit facts. That being said, he still doesn't sleep another wink that night. He pours himself a few cups of coffee, subconsciously avoiding anything reflective, and sits in bed until sunrise, just watching his bedroom door. Better safe than sorry, he keeps repeating in the empty corridors of his addled brain. He drives to work the next morning like he always does. Sitting at a stoplight, a car pulls up next to him, and he catches something in the reflection of the car's window. It's that monster again, sitting next to him, reaching out towards him with one of its huge hands. The detective gasps and spins around, his eyes flaring with panic. But of course, it isn't there. Just some children on the sidewalk on their way to school. Maybe it's the fear, maybe it's the sleep deprivation, maybe it's both. But in that moment, he feels like crying. Little does he know, things are going to get so much worse. Over the following days, the frequency of the sightings increases. Anytime he finds his eyes meeting a reflective surface, that monster is there, approaching him. But of course, it runs away before he can ever look at it head on. The people at work keep giving him funny looks. He grits his teeth. He can't say anything. If he tells anyone what's been happening to him, they'll haul him off to the funny farm to spend the rest of his life in a padded cell. But he knows he's not crazy. It's too real to be the product of human insanity. This isn't some hallucination. That thing is really there. It's always waiting, always watching. Even when he can't see it, he can feel its eyes on him, sense its malicious intent. It's even worse at night. Every time he tries to sleep, it attacks him. He feels its hand clasping around his throat. He feels its bald fists pummeling his body. He feels its long fingernails scratching into his skin. He can't sleep anymore. He's too scared. And that too takes its toll. Every feeling, every emotion, every thought starts to take on an odd, flat quality, like nothing is quite real. He starts to subsist on coffee, energy drinks, and anything else that will give him a buzz of alertness. He started to carry his service pistol around with him everywhere. He hides it under his pillow at night. He can never be too careful. He knows that the creature is always out there, always watching, always waiting. He knows on some level that it won't stop until it has taken everything from him. He's taking the subway to work again. He's messy, disoriented. His clothes stink. His bloodshot eyes are couched in unsightly bags. He shivers slightly, a nervous twitch. Put simply, he's not the man he used to be. He can't drive anymore. His nerves are too wrecked, and he has to take the bus to and from work. That's when he sees it, not behind him this time, but on the other side of the street as he waits for his bus. It stands among the other pedestrians, all seemingly oblivious to its presence. It just smiles, mocking him. This time, the detective is ready. The detective won't have it. In a single fluid motion, he unholsters his pistol and begins firing at the creature. The street erupts into screams as people scatter to avoid the frantic volley of gunshots, but the creature doesn't move. It just keeps grinning as the detective fires, the rage and sleep deprivation throwing off his aim. He hears the sound of the bell again, its toll rising, its deafening. He needs to kill it. He needs to get closer. The detective walks toward the creature, firing bullet after bullet. The creature doesn't care. He roars in animal fury. The bell toll rises. A sudden light illuminates the creature's terrible smile, as the detective realizes that the sound he's hearing isn't the toll of the bell at all. He turns just in time to see the bus, but not in enough time to get out of the way. The cowbell the detective found in the barn that day seemed innocuous enough, but this old cowbell corroded and covered in rust, which no known methods, chemical or mechanical, seemed to be able to remove, would soon have a name, SCP-513. It was discovered by an SCP Foundation agent during containment re-established procedure MU at a classified containment site, where its interior was covered in duct tape to prevent it from properly making a sound. There was also a paper note attached, reading, You've seen it. Now he can hear you. You've touched it. Now he can see you. Never ring it. If you hear it, he can touch you. And this is a warning worth heeding, because ringing SCP-513 invariably results in death. The question is just how much mental and physical anguish it puts its victim through before that endpoint. When the bell is first rung, anyone within earshot will begin to experience extreme anxiety, including physical symptoms such as heightened heart rate and raised blood pressure. They will also report feelings of dread and may claim that they can feel themselves being watched. Within about an hour, this worry is confirmed. 
SCP-513-1 is the less-than-charming creature hounding the unfortunate bell ringer, and will begin to stalk the affected individuals. It will appear to approach individuals from behind, but quickly disappear if ever the subject attempts direct visual contact. It will also stage non-lethal physical attacks on its victims during their sleep in order to induce greater levels of psychological terror, though it disappears quickly upon waking. The stalking threat will only elevate over time, leading to increased psychological disarray for the victim. SCP-513-1 will eventually induce paranoia, aggression, hypervigilance, and depression, ending in a distressing and violent death. Because of the immense danger posed to anyone who hears the sound of this cowbell tolling, SCP-513 has been given extensive containment precautions, extensive enough to warrant giving it the Euclid Containment Class, a classification reserved for things that are often unpredictable in containment. SCP-513 is suspended in a one cubic meter block of gelatin and contained within a soundproofed, climate-controlled cell. The gelatin is inspected daily for any degradation or loss of integrity. An emergency inspection is carried out immediately following any earthquake, explosion, or sonic event grade 2 or higher. Personnel performing the inspection wear earplugs and active noise-canceling earmuffs at all times while inside SCP-513's cell to avoid any kind of accidental exposure. If the gelatin cube shows any signs of degradation, such as rips, tears, splits, liquefaction, or mold, SCP-513 will be immediately removed and suspended within a replacement cube by a team of surgically deafened Class D personnel. No other personnel are to enter the cell during this procedure. Any sentient beings exposed to SCP-513 are to be monitored by at least two security personnel at all times. Under absolutely no circumstances may exposure victims be administered sedatives or allowed to fall unconscious. Any victim who does fall unconscious is to be terminated immediately. Class D personnel are to be terminated at the first sign of mental degradation. All other exposure victims may be terminated at their request. If possible, SCP-513-1 is to be apprehended on site, but sadly, the Foundation hasn't managed to get their hands on this unpleasant creature yet. But be careful ringing any mysterious old bells you find, or else he might just get his hands on you. These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up. Probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver Orhe in days, and on top of it all, his loyal dog Marybell is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Marybell keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Marybell shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her, pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her and in one deft motion scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Jorge, and in this weather, she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains. She'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand, he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. Ma, I'm home. I, I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size. No taking yet. He blows again for longer, 
and again. He feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame. It's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled-up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's... No, don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale. Deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um... We have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only, the sound of his breath is joined by another. A tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like cocoa? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me cocoa. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin. Way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. 
The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orhe had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell. But now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried, just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well, yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just... the light. Now he's even more confused. But try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out. And try as she might, the little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Mary Bell was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It's bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a... Oh no. There's a semi down there, a big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orhe's, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. Can't be. It... But it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orhe's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, is Orhe's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orhe is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. 
the tops of his thighs too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orhe's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else, or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he? The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in his truck? I don't know. Did he? Was he? The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up. Not just once, but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. Marybelle is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma has stopped moaning. The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Marybelle slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off. Yet none of them are getting any fatter. The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. How do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually, but she's been eating just fine. It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Marybelle whines softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Marybell down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe... Marybelle passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. But there's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away.
There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen, which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong. Too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket, and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Marybelle at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. Human embryos, with the same genetic code as the tapeworm, begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms, lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe, yet. The embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a 10-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a 9-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. Their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. 
If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently 10 instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13, under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have Level 4 security clearance and must have written permission, and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. It's an average day at Site 43 of the SCP Foundation, and a new researcher has arrived for her first day at the site. She fills out an intimidating stack of onboarding paperwork, takes a picture for her new ID badge, and meets her direct supervisor. There's something you should probably know about working at this site, he begins, but an alarm sounds down the hall, and he has to rush away to attend to it. We'll finish this later, don't move, he calls to her before he disappears from sight. Then she's left alone, twiddling her thumbs, shifting from foot to foot, and looking at her new workplace. It looks like any other Foundation site for the most part. One unusual thing does catch her eye, though. There are mirrors everywhere, all along the walls of the hallway, seemingly all the way down until the hallway bends out of sight. What could those possibly be for? As she runs through the possibilities in her head, she hears the squeaking wheels of a mop cart coming toward her. A janitor is making his way across the floor, mopping at the tiles as he goes. He has a pair of headphones covering his ears, and she thinks about interrupting him to ask about the mirrors, but doesn't want to disturb him. Then, she spots something just behind the janitor, reflected in the mirror, that makes her scream and drop her clipboard. There is a face, ashen and ghastly, like some horrible phantom out of a scary story. She spins around, expecting to see the horrible face lurking behind her, but there's nothing there. Whatever the thing is, it's just in the mirror. When her supervisor returns, he finds her pale and sweating, her hands shaking. She stumbles over her words, trying to tell him what she just saw. He laughs at her <laughs> wide-eyed expression and says, Oh, don't worry, that's just Philip and his constant companion. Then, he tells her all about SCP-5056. SCP-5056 is a hairless humanoid entity with gray matte skin and three slash-like scars on its face, resembling the placement of eyes and a mouth. It does not have a physical, corporeal form, at least on the visual spectrum, and can only be seen in reflective surfaces. It appears to prefer manifesting in glass, especially mirrors and lenses. Any equipment or media that captures the entity's image will begin to degrade on an atomic level. Though anyone can see SCP-5056 when it appears in a reflective surface, only one person is able to hear it speak. Philip E. Deering, also referred to as SCP-5056-B. Philip Deering is a white man with brown eyes and brown hair, standing at 172 centimeters tall. He joined the staff of SCP Foundation Site-43 as a custodian in July of 1999, and for his first three years of service, there was nothing notable about him. He was a pleasant man, though occasionally prone to bouts of depression, and was a reliable employee. In September of 2002, however, his behavior changed following a disastrous incident involving anomalous materials in a chromatic abatement facility AAF-D. After this incident occurred, Philip began exhibiting signs of auditory hallucinations, reacting to sounds that no one else could hear. At first, this was thought to be the result of a mental health episode brought on by stress and trauma, but the discovery of SCP-5056 soon proved that the voice he was hearing was not, in fact, in his head. Since the first day it appeared to him, SCP-5056 has followed Philip everywhere he goes. It has not expressed interest in any other people or entities, except for situations where it felt that Philip was being threatened. It is aware of other entities, it simply does not care about them. As for its behavior toward Philip, SCP-5056 has historically behaved in a way opposite to Philip's emotional needs. When Philip is trying to sleep, it opens its mouth scar and screams. It picks verbal fights with him when he is overwhelmed or sad, including reminding him of estranged family members, awkward social interactions, and personal failings. He has gotten used to his companion over the years, even giving notes on its less-than-effective insults and encouraging creativity. He has even given the entity a nickname, Doug. SCP-5056 becomes enraged when separated from Philip, and if there is no available reflective surface upon which it can manifest and speak to him, it will begin to act out. After nine seconds have passed without SCP-5056 having access to Philip, it will begin to vibrate at an intense speed and emit an endless 119 decibel sound that reverberates through the entirety of Site-43. 
As soon as Philip is returned to 5056's line of sight, both the sound and the vibrating will immediately stop. Staff in the area have been made aware of the entity's presence and its aggressive tendencies. Following an incident involving Dr. Bradbury, who experienced immense psychological distress after SCP-5056 appeared in one of the lenses of her eyeglasses that led to her eventual resignation, no one wearing glasses or any other reflective eyewear is permitted to interact with Philip or SCP-5056. Because SCP-5056 has no physical body, it cannot be truly contained in a traditional sense. However, its location seems to be bound to Phillips, and therefore limiting Phillips' movements to Site-43 has provided the Foundation with a workable solution. Aside from the issue with Dr. Bradbury, there has only been one other notable incident involving SCP-5056 so far. On January 23, 2003, Dr. Falkirk decided to perform an experiment that would prove Philip was not necessary for the containment of SCP-5056. Philip was sent to an observation room and instructed to turn on recording equipment. In the room, there was a steel table, a steel chair, and a hand mirror. After Philip sat down in the room, SCP-5056 warned him to get out. He ignored it and proceeded to talk with Dr. Falkirk. Falkirk gave an order to initiate phase two of the experiment, and Philip began to have trouble breathing. After several seconds, he lost consciousness. Dr. Falkirk turned his and his assistant's attention to the mirror, where SCP-5056 was still present. It became enraged, yelling for Philip, and attacked Dr. Falkirk. Though the specific details of the attack are lost from official records, he was subsequently given medical treatment for blood loss, facial injuries, and the loss of his left eye. He has been under intensive psychological care ever since. Though no one but Philip is able to hear a word SCP-5056 says, any recording device that he activates will pick up the entity's voice. In order to give the research team a better sense of SCP-5056's behavior, Philip's uniform contains a microphone that is always on and always recording his conversations. It has, over the years, picked up everything that passes between Philip and the world around him, from his conversations with co-workers to the tiny torments and verbal barbs from SCP-5056. In 2020, however, the microphone recorded a series of events that would change Philip and his relationship to the anomaly in the mirror forever. Philip was struggling with a sense of crushing isolation, with the majority of his social interaction coming from Dr. Ngo and SCP-5056. The only bright spot in his days was the presence of Chief Amelia Tarosian of the janitorial and maintenance section, who would often visit Philip to chat while he was mopping. They spoke regularly for months, joking with each other about work, Amelia asking questions about Philip's life with 5056, all while the entity needled Philip about his apparent crush on Amelia. On September 9, 2020, however, Amelia confessed something. She returned his feelings. The audio transcription from this day captured this revelation. I never really thought... I didn't think you... Philip began. Really? Really, Amelia retorted. Yeah, really. Well, I mean, I didn't think you... Either, she admitted. Philip laughed at this. Are you kidding? You've got to be kidding. I mean, you're... A moment of silence passed between the two, the air crackling with nervous excitement. How long... He began. She interrupted. Since I met you. He laughed again, a giddy sound. You had that on speed dial. Well, how long... She started. This time, he interrupted. Since I met you. They both laughed for a long time before falling silent once again. What are you thinking about? Amelia asked. Can't you tell? She shook her head. No? Confusing me with your anxiety surrogate? He hasn't said a word tonight. Philip smiled softly at this. I must not have any anxieties right now. The two quickly developed a romantic relationship, Philip brushing off the doubts that SCP-5056 tried to plant in his mind. On June 11, 2021, Dr. Ngo conducted Philip's annual psychological review, and they discussed the notable changes in his demeanor and worldview. The audio from the session has been transcribed. Thanks for letting me do this a day early, Philip began. Well, hey, I have a social engagement tomorrow, Dr. Ngo replied. Philip laughed heartily at that. You know, that might be the first time I've heard you laugh. Let's talk about that. SCP-5056 started to speak. Yes, let's talk about... But Philip cut it off. About how humorless and morose I am? The entity was stunned into silence. Dr. Ngo spoke up. Was he about to say that? Are you finishing his thoughts now? Why not? They used to be my thoughts. What changed? SCP-5056 spoke up again. Nothing. Philip disagreed. A lot of things. Some of them because of Doug. Some of them because of me. Some of them... Chief Tarosian, 
Dr. Gnyo finished the thought for him. Yeah, I guess I didn't really care about improving myself until I had someone to improve for. Doug beat a lot of my flaws out of me. There just wasn't enough room in my head for self-pity or self-loathing or even selfishness with him nattering away in the background all day every day. But Amy gave me something to actually work toward. I actually... This time, 5056 finished his thought. You stopped wasting your life. Go on, Dr. Nyo encouraged. It feels strange to say, because this has been a terrible year all over, but it still meant so much to me. Dr. Gnyo nodded. You achieved something. I achieved something, and I reached out. My life isn't one long, indifferently narrated one-man show anymore. Sure, I'm still stuck underground, but I'm not alone down here anymore. SCP-5056 spoke up, giving one final thought. You are never alone, Philip. You will never, ever be alone. Never again. What's he saying? Something spooky? Dr. Nyo asked. Philip shook his head. It's phrased that way, but that's not how I'm taking it. The next morning, Philip prepared to take a life-changing step. He stood in front of a mirror, dressed in a tuxedo, and adjusted his bow tie. How do I look, Doug? He asked. Because I can't see with you in the mirror. SCP-5056 replied, You're making a mistake. Philip laughed it off. Yeah, I've never been good at bow ties. I'd use a clip-on, but Amy would never forgive me, and anyway, it would clash with the tuxedo. SCP-5056 pushed further, refusing to let it go. You aren't ready for this. I definitely am. But hey, if you have objections, feel free to shout them out at the appropriate time. Nobody but me will hear you, but if you make good points, I'll be sure to pass them along. You won't hold up your end. I'd do anything for her. You don't have the energy. I've never felt this good. Are you even trying here, buddy? It won't change who you are. It already has. It won't fix you. <laughs> Philip laughed, pulling his bow tie tight. He turned away from the mirror and toward the next chapter of his life with one final statement. I don't need to be fixed. As long as she had known him, Amelia Tarosian had demonstrated kindness, care, empathy, and curiosity toward Philip. Unlike her colleagues, she was not put off by the presence of SCP-5056, but approached it with an open mind and an appreciation for the entirety of Philip's self, the man beyond the anomaly. The two were married in Ipperwash Provincial Park on June 12, 2021, and have been together ever since. Notably, Amelia has reported that SCP-5056 remains largely dormant in her presence, allowing the two to spend their time together without interruption. Following Philip's relationship with Amelia and the improvement to his mental state, as well as changes to SCP-5056's behavior, the Foundation conducted a review and reassessment of the anomaly. Several high-ranking Foundation staff wrote down their changing thoughts on SCP-5056 and contributed them to the official revised file. Amelia R. Tarosian, chief of the janitorial and maintenance section and wife of Philip Deering, wrote, I don't think anyone understood Doug when he first manifested. They all thought he was an anomalous abuser, a demon with a short fuse, existing just to get a rise out of someone. They tell me Phil was plenty risable back then, introverted and absent-minded, the perfect jump scare target. But once he stopped being jumpy, Doug started needling him about his low self-esteem. Once he started standing up for himself, Doug made him worry about other people's needs. By the time I met him in 2019, Phil was considerate, unflappable, and still absolutely miserable. That's when Doug started bugging him about his love life. I don't think Doug is preying on Phil. I think he's trying to help. Dr. Harold R. Blank, chair of the Archives and Revision section, contributed, For the longest time, we thought Phil might be anomalous as well. We even tossed around the idea of classing him Thaumio, which obviously didn't fly. At the very least, we were pretty sure Doug was an unconscious manifestation of his internal monologue, so we labeled it 5056-A and made him 5056-B. After nearly two decades of observation, however, I can say with near certainty that there is nothing at all remarkable about Philip Eugene Deering beyond his unusual equanimity in the face of enduring trauma. He is no longer considered an SCP object, and his paranormal paramour has been reclassified as simply SCP-5056 a self-containing, incorporeal, emotional parasite requiring no containment because it voluntarily restricts itself to the presence of a man who voluntarily restricts himself to a secure underground bunker. We're still not sure what will happen when Phil dies, but my guess is 5056 gets one last class change to neutralized. Dr. Melissa Bradbury, chair of the Research and Experimentation section, included, 
No, I can't tell you what I saw, but I can tell you what I felt. That's only after more than a decade of Foundation psychotherapy, mind you. I was comatose for 11 months and endured three years of blurry vision because I couldn't put on a pair of specs or contact lenses without having a panic attack. When that thing filled up my vision, it felt like someone had gut-punched my brain. You know that late-night experience where you suddenly remember some stupid or embarrassing thing you did in your life and it makes you feel ashamed? Well, imagine if you suddenly thought of every stupid or embarrassing thing you'd ever done, all at once, like your conscience finally got fed up and decided to go nuclear on you. No wonder Falkirk tore his eye out. Delfina M. Ibanez, chief of the Pursuit and Suppression section, had this to say. When Blank said we should let Deering keep playing janitor under his pet monster's watchful eye scars, I was skeptical. I was chief of security and containment, and that sounded like the polar opposite of both concepts. I'm happy to say I was wrong. Deering has absolutely nil combat utility, and without 5056, his disaster response priority would be somewhere just above the D-Class, and we don't even have D-Class at 43. But with 5056, he's practically an intruder deterrent system. You know what they say. A friend is someone who will help you move, a best friend is someone who will disintegrate your enemy's eyes. Dr. Noon T. Nyo, chair of the psychology and parapsychology section, wrote, SCP-5056 has co-opted JM-64's negative thought processes, externalizing his melancholy and self-doubt. His earliest psych evaluations suggested a proclivity towards intrusive anxious thoughts. Because these thoughts are now literally intrusive, he can assess them much more rationally than he could without anomalous intervention. We still don't know what 5056 is, but I can say this much. It is devoted to its opposite number, and wants to help him. It expresses affection in a grating, alien manner, but there's no arguing with the results. It's taken 19 years, but Deering has finally made peace with himself. Of course, he's had a little extra help in that regard. Finally, Dr. Polixeni Metaxas, chair of the spectrometry and spectrometry section, said, They've called this a haunting for 19 years. It's even entered the general terminology. A Deering-class haunting denotes the stalking of a corporeal being by an incorporeal one. Nobody really thinks of 5056 as a ghost, however. Nobody but me. The materials handling disaster which created Doug also annihilated at least two of our subjects in containment. The nature of those subjects is highly classified, but I can say this much. They are intimately connected to the cycles of guilt and apathy through which human society writ large regularly cycles. Is it too much of a stretch to suggest that one of them, or a fragment of one of them, was reconstituted in that thaumaturgical soup into Deering's inescapable conscience? If that's what happened, well, perhaps it still doesn't make him all that different from the rest of us. We're all haunted by something and we're all haunting something ourselves. Our hopes and fears are just voices in our heads that only we can hear. Everything we are is just the hallucination of a hollow frame of meat and bone. So what separates us from the thing on the other side of the mirror? Three dimensions and room to grow. Since the reassessment, the containment measures for SCP-5056 have been updated. It is now considered to be self-containing with its position fixed to that of Philip. Philip is prohibited from leaving SCP Foundation facilities without direction from security clearance level 4 plus personnel, and must carry at least one reflective object on his person at all times. Any new or visiting staff must be briefed by Philip on the nature of SCP-5056. He is also required to undergo mental health treatment, mainly exposure response prevention therapy, which allows him to respond to his intrusive thoughts without acting on them. Though SCP-5056 once terrified Philip, bringing him endless distress, he has grown accustomed to its presence. Even when the things 5056 tells him are upsetting, he considers them to be necessary reflections of his inner life, providing him with introspection he has never been capable of on his own. Since Philip's marriage, the entity has grown more and more passive, appearing only to bring up areas that need improvement in the relationship, reminding Philip of ways he can be a better husband to Amelia. Just as Philip has become more comfortable with the presence of SCP-5056, so too has the rest of the Foundation staff. Perhaps, even if they're not entirely aware of it, they recognize something of themselves in that dynamic. Don't we all live with demons of our own, constant companions whispering our insecurities back to us, reminding us of the ways in which we fall short? They may not be as anomalous as SCP-5056, but their hold on us can be just as powerful, just as destructive. The only way to contain them is to look them in the face, learn to talk back, and decide against all odds to go after what we want anyway. We may never be truly rid of them, never be completely alone, and without that gray shadow lurking at our side. But that's okay. We can carry it with us, accepting that our fears, our hurts, our nagging anxieties are necessary parts of who we are. 
but we can also argue back against the voice that tells us we'll never be truly happy and say, yes, I will, because I deserve it. Eventually, we might just believe it enough for that voice to finally shut up. The single piercing high-pitched note echoes through the cathedral. It hangs in the air as the boy sustains it for far longer than his small lungs should be capable of. The boy is the star of the choir and is well known throughout his city and even beyond, and people come from far and wide for the chance to hear his perfect soprano voice. But on this night, there are only a few people scattered amongst the many rows of pews to listen to the choir as it practices. And for good reason. While the boy's lauded voice is as sweet and powerful sounding as ever, the choir itself is at its lowest point in recent memory. This nadir has occurred because many of the other boys who used to sing in the choir have vanished. The choir finishes its song, that's all for tonight, and the boys begin to put on their coats and gather their things from underneath their chairs. The boy with the perfect voice feels something on his shoulder and spins around with a fright to see that it is just the hand of the priest, who is also the conductor of the choir. The priest is an old man with a deeply wrinkled yet kind face, and he reminds the boy that he is to head straight home. The boy promises the priest that he will go directly to his house, and the priest reassuringly pats the boy on the shoulder before walking away to give the same advice to each of the other boys. The boy steps out into the dark, cold night as the heavy cathedral doors shut behind him. It's softly raining, and he pulls his coat shut to try to keep out the damp and cold. As the boy begins to walk, he takes note of the closed newsstand across the street. The day's papers are still hanging outside and tell of yet another boy who has gone missing, this one from the next town over. There are still no leads in the cases, and parents have been growing angry with the police over the lack of any progress. As the boy walks down the darkened street, he fails to notice the shadowy figure that has stepped out of a dark alley near the cathedral, but soon he hears the sound of feet on the wet sidewalk behind him. He glances over his shoulder and sees that the figure is walking the same direction as him. The boy looks back straight ahead, not wanting to draw any more attention to himself, and tries to increase his pace. As the boy walks, his well-trained ears quickly detect that whoever is walking behind him has sped up as well. The boy doesn't run, but he feels a surge of real fear begin to rise inside of him. The boy picks up his pace even more, and again hears the person behind him increase theirs. The boy is walking so fast now that if he went any faster, he'd have to break into a run. His house isn't far, though. He turns a corner, and he can see it, a quaint little home with warm light pouring out through the windows. He knows that inside his mother will be standing in the kitchen cooking dinner. He knows that inside is protection from the night and shadows. The boy looks behind him and sees the figure round the same corner. The boy can't wait any longer, and he starts to run and he sees over his shoulder that the figure has begun to run as well. The boy is sprinting as fast as he can, his feet kicking up water from the sidewalk. He can hear the figure getting closer and closer to him, their long legs outpacing his own with ease. He's so close to his house, though. He's so close to being dry and warm and safe. He slides to a stop on the damp stones in front of the door and reaches out for the handle. Inside the warm little house, the woman cooking dinner is startled by the sound of the door suddenly bursting open. She turns to see an empty doorway. She steps out into the street, but it too is empty, nothing present but the sound of the wind and the almost imperceptible sound of a single note being sung, a beautiful, high-pitched note. What happened to the boy who was once the shining star of the cathedral's choir? And what of the other missing boys? Where did they all go? Perhaps they went to SCP-2678, a mysterious spatial anomaly that is also known as a city all of blood. SCP-2678 is an extra-dimensional space that so far is known to be accessible through exactly one entrance, a door in the basement of the Siena Cathedral in Siena, Italy. Strangely, the extra-dimensional location behind the door is only able to be entered by individuals who hold what could be termed traditionally Catholic beliefs. Perhaps even stranger, though, is that when it was first discovered, the door to the space was barred and a metal placard had been placed next to it that read, SCP Foundation Department of Abnormalities. This might not sound especially odd, but it came as quite a surprise to the agents investigating it, as there is no record of there ever having existed a Department of Abnormalities within the SCP Foundation, other than SCP-3790, of course, which is another padlocked room bearing a similar sign, but that file has been locked by the O5 Council, 
and we will have to save our exploration of that for another time. Back to SCP-2678. Individuals who have Catholic beliefs that enter the SCP-2678 space find that they emerge into a small, tent-like structure that appears to be a sort of forward operating base that has been built around the freestanding doorway. The outpost is abandoned, but there still remains a number of strange objects, including a biomedical laboratory-grade refrigerator containing numerous samples of blood and bone, various types of audio recorders ranging from old wax strip models to magnetic tape machines, and a computer terminal which, when activated, requests Foundation credentials. However, all attempts to access this computer have been met with failure, as it has rejected all attempts for reasons of insufficient clearance. Also found inside the outpost was the score for a previously unknown choral prelude titled Sul Golgata, which when translated from Italian means On Golgotha, with Golgotha being the name of the hill that Jesus Christ was crucified on, according to the Bible. The last object found in the tent was a skeleton, though several bones were missing, including the hip bone and both forearms. Further examination of the skeleton revealed it to have belonged to a young male, though the exact cause of death was unable to be determined, nor was it clear whether the bones had been removed before or after the young man expired. Upon exiting the outpost, visitors to SCP-2678 will find that they are on the outskirts of a gigantic city that is floating in the middle of a red-orange void. The city is truly massive, having been measured at being over 300 square kilometers in size, and consisting entirely of cathedrals, palaces, and churches, all of which are in the Italian Gothic style of architecture. A never-ending rain of a red liquid that was found to be human blood falls on the city at all times and has stained the buildings a deep red color, and while they appear at first glance to be made of marble, analysis has found that all the buildings are actually constructed of human bone. Specifically, bones belonging to human males aged 7 to 12. Later tests of the material found within the forward outpost's biomedical refrigerator revealed the stored blood and bones to be samples taken from throughout the city. No life has ever been observed within SCP-2678, though visitors have reported hearing a high-pitched, discordant melody that seems to come from somewhere deep within the maze of structures. All attempts to record the sound have failed, as all audio equipment malfunctions when within the space, and playback of recordings results in them having only picked up the sound of the blood rain falling at a very high volume. This explains the various types of audio equipment found in the forward outpost, which were likely used in unsuccessful attempts to record the music. Attempts to trace the source of the melody through the labyrinth-like city will inevitably lead to the same building, which is an exact replica of the same Siena Cathedral that the entrance to SCP-2678 is located in. Though it too is made of bone, and has been stained red from the falling blood. And while the outside of the cathedral perfectly matches its real-world counterpart, the inside is a different story. Inside the cathedral, one will find only a single, large pipe organ. The pipe organ has had its longest pipes, the ones that produce the lowest notes, cut in half, and the corresponding pedal boards torn out. Pressing a key on the organ will produce a note that mimics an adolescent male's voice, and each key has its own unique voice. Just like with a normal pipe organ, a note can be sustained for as long as the key is pressed down, though after a time, the voice emanating from the organ will seem to take on a panic tone. Attempts to determine just how the organ produces the notes have been met with failure, as the organ does not have a wind box, bellows, or blower of any kind, which would normally move air through the pipes. The organ has another effect within SCP-2678 besides just producing sounds, though, as whenever a note is played, the rain falling outside will transform into regular water. No matter how long the note is held, and the now regular clear rain falls though, the buildings will never be washed and always continue to be stained red. Tests were performed on the organ in order to determine just how long it could sustain a single note, and the C7 key was pressed for over 20 minutes, during which time the voice continued to sing out, becoming more and more stressed and panicked sounding as time went on. Finally, at the 23 minute mark, the key itself splintered into pieces, permanently removing the ability to produce that note. The splintered remains of the key were also observed to bleed for several days following this test. Expeditions sent into SCP-2678 have resulted in agents appearing to undergo a number of behavioral changes that, at present, are hypothesized to come as a result of hearing the organ music within. The psychological changes have included an increased appreciation for choir music, an ever stronger belief in structured religion, 
More trust in authority figures, less trust in those coming from a lower social or economic status, and a reluctance to report crimes committed by fellow members of the SCP Foundation. These changes appear to be permanent as well, as there has been no evidence of them fading with time. Unfortunately, little to no progress has been made in understanding the mysterious and unnerving space, nor what the presence of a Department of Abnormalities forward operating base inside could mean, and so for the time being, all further explorations within have been cancelled. The doorway in the basement of the Siena Cathedral has once again been barred, with the entrance hidden behind a bookshelf, and the ease with which the extra-dimensional location can be contained by the Foundation has resulted in it being given the safe classification. What do you think SCP-2678 actually is? Who built the strange city of blood and bone? If it was built by a person at all, you can never win a fight in Minnie Mouse ears. The girlfriend learns that lesson the hard way in the car driving through Florida. No matter how articulate you are, how many one-liners your brain throws together on the spot, or even how right you are, if you are wearing Minnie Mouse ears, you just won't win the argument. You said it was all booked! She yells, throwing her arms in the air and sending drops of iced caramel latte all over the inside of the rental car. He snatches the drink out of her hand and plants it firmly in the cup holder. He yells back at her that it wasn't his fault. How was he supposed to know the payment was declined? You didn't even check for a confirmation email? She scowls and crosses her arms. Her boyfriend glances across at her and laughs. I just can't take you seriously in those, her boyfriend says, pointing at the Minnie Mouse ears. She punches the button to wind the window down, rips the ears off of her head, and is about to throw the big black ears out the window. Only, she can't do it. Looking at the little bow, she feels her bottom lip start to tremble. She deflates, feeling the fight go out of her. I'm sorry, she says. I just really wanted to go to Disney World. I know. The pair of them drive in silence for a moment. The fight wasn't really about Disney. None of their fights were ever about what was really wrong. They'd always pick stupid, superficial things and shout about those, but not say what was really going wrong deeper down. That said, not getting to go to Disney World isn't just a superficial thing to her. Growing up in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, she was very much used to having to explain to people where she was from. Sleepy Eye, yes, that's its real name. It's near New Ulm, near Mankato, about two hours from Minneapolis. If you don't know where Minneapolis is, she can't help you. Anyway. This trip was her first real adventure. She'd never left Minnesota much before. The flight down to Florida had been her first time on an airplane. All to come to the happiest place on Earth. Only they got to the front gates and her boyfriend realized his payment had been declined. Did they have the money to buy two new tickets on the door? Of course not. They've blown it all on airfares, car rental, airport food, and a pair of Minnie Mouse ears. I'm sure there are plenty of great things to do in Florida her boyfriend says, trying to sound optimistic. For free? He doesn't reply. They just drive on in silence. Without a ticket to go to Disney World, they have no choice but to spend what little cash they have left on a motel for the night. It takes them about an hour to get there. The girlfriend gets straight out of the car and into their room, slamming the door behind her. Her boyfriend will just have to take a walk for a bit. There are cockroaches in the sink and some questionable stains on the bed, walls, and every flat surface in the room. There is apparently a pool out the back, but she's heard the stories of alligators roaming around this state and is in no mood to roll that dice in a place like this. She opens YouTube on her phone and puts on a horror video to listen to in the background. That calms her down. She loves that kind of thing. After 20 minutes, there's a soft knock at the door. Looking apologetic as anything, her boyfriend nudges his way into the room, holding a brochure in his hand. She snatches it off him without a word and reads it with as grumpy of an expression as possible. Spooky self-guided tours in Florida. Visit the infamously haunted Pensacola Lighthouse today to chill your bones in the Florida heat. Explore the scariest spot on the coast for free with a special Disney twist. Okay, fine. Her boyfriend does know how to cheer her up, but she can't let him know that. He's still supposed to be in trouble. But the following night, as the pair of them approach the lighthouse in the pitch darkness, she can't help but crack a smile. With the light at the top turned off and the railing surrounding the building stabbing sharply into the air, the place certainly looks pretty haunted. The brochure tells them that the place is a maritime museum during the day, but is currently closed to the public for maintenance. However, there's a spare key to be found right under… Got it! Her boyfriend straightens up proudly and turns to hand her the key that he retrieved from under the flower pot. She scowls at him to make sure he still knows he's in trouble for not getting them into Disney, 
but she does secretly feel a little glimmer of affection. He's always been the first behind the couch during horror movies, so he's clearly trying his best to make it up to her. The creaking noise that she was really hoping for doesn't come when she opens the door. It opens smoothly. Her boyfriend flicks the light switch instinctively, and the inside of the museum immediately lights up, showing glass cabinets, old nautical equipment, and a few flags. She groans and switches the lights back off. It's not exactly a haunted tour if you just turn all the lights on. But the magic of the room is gone now. They've now seen everything, nothing lurking in the dark, no shadows, just a boring old museum. They trudge into the next room. There's so much streetlight spilling through the window that they can see practically everything in here as well. It's a recreation of the old lighthouse keeper's bedroom. A couple of old-looking beds, antique wardrobes, and clothes from the olden days. So much for a haunted lighthouse. This is so lame, the girlfriend groans and switches the light on. Even her boyfriend isn't looking scared by any of this. There's literally nothing to be scared of in here, can we just go home? Her boyfriend looks apologetic again. He's really tried to salvage this vacation, but it just hasn't happened. She can't be too mad at him. You know what? No, she says. Let's at least finish looking around this museum, then we can go. We can just switch on the lights, read the exhibits, and see the view from on top of the lighthouse. So they do that. The pair of them go back into the first room and start reading through the signs under each of the displays. There's a diagram explaining all of the different knots that sailors used to tie. A long paragraph all about how the lighthouse used to burn oil but now runs on electricity generated by… The girlfriend yawns. Without the adrenaline of any ghosts, museums are much harder work in the middle of the night. It isn't even Disney themed like the brochure promised. The only Disney thing in here is that Mickey Mouse mascot in the corner. It doesn't even fit with the rest of the museum, just a random costume on a mannequin. It must be almost seven feet tall. Her boyfriend is staring at it real close. He leans in, examining the material up close under the bright museum lights. This thing's weird, he says. I wonder how old it is. Look, the white's all faded, and it's got this fur effect. Crunch! Mickey Mouse chomps into her boyfriend's arm with a ferocious set of teeth. Neither of them reacts at all, frozen by total disbelief as Mickey stands there his huge rat-like fangs embedded in the boyfriend's arm. He yanks it from the cartoon character's jaws, blood leaking from the wounds. How can this be happening? Mickey's eyes flick between the two of them. He raises a gloved hand and waves. The boyfriend shrieks, turns on his heels and runs, clattering into one of the exhibits as he goes. He crashes into her and the wound on his arm hits her in the chest. She looks down, confused at the blood stain on her shirt, then back at Mickey Mouse. He gives a little shooing motion with his hands. Run. Now it's her turn to scream. She grabs her boyfriend and bundles him out of the room. Mickey was standing right by the entrance. They're gonna have to hope there's another way out somewhere deeper in the museum. They run through room after room, every few steps turning to see Mickey following them. He isn't running at all, he's sauntering along, arms swinging cartoonishly around. Just like in Steamboat Willie, he's whistling a tune to himself as he goes. That must be the door out of here. The pair of them crash into it and go tumbling into the next room. There's blood everywhere. Her boyfriend is looking more and more pale by the second. They're not outside, though. They're in a small circular room with a spiral staircase running up, up, up into darkness. Mickey's whistling is getting louder. They don't have a choice here. The girlfriend jumps up and hauls her tiring boyfriend to his feet. Putting his unwounded arm over her shoulder, she half carries him up the stairs, feeling the metal spiral shudder under them with every step. Halfway up, she looks back over her shoulder. Mickey is standing in the doorway. He waves enthusiastically. Her legs are burning by the time she reaches the top of the lighthouse. Barging open the door, she throws her boyfriend rather unceremoniously up onto the balcony around the big light. Panting, she turns back around to look back down into the darkness below them. Mickey is standing by a big switch on the wall. <laughs> he laughs and flips the switch. A big clunking sound comes from the light next to her. Very slowly at first, it starts to spin. The light flickers on dimly, dimly at first, then gets brighter. Faster and faster it spins, brighter and brighter the beam until it's blinding. She raises an arm to shield herself from the piercing light. Against the dark of the night, her eyes can't adjust between light and dark fast enough. She's going blind up here. From below, she hears a heavy footstep on metal, then another. The whistling starts again as Mickey cheerfully makes his way up to them. She glances down at him. He waves happily up at her again. She almost waves back instinctively. No, now's not the time. She needs to come up with a plan. But her brain just can't do it. For all the horror movies she's watched, all the times where she's screaming at the TV telling the protagonist what to do, now that she's in one for herself, she's got nothing. 
But wait, maybe she does have something. A pair of gloved hands appear on the doorframe, gripping the wood tightly. A smiling Mickey Mouse pops his head around the door, blood all over his chin. He just stays there for a moment, eyes flitting between her and her boyfriend, bleeding out on the floor. He sticks a comically large shoe out from the doorway and steps out onto the gallery to join them. The light swings around and shines in his face. As soon as it hits him, he bares his teeth, thousands of them, and shrieks in their faces. That's it. The girlfriend runs at him, fast as she can. At the last moment, she jumps, bends her legs, and with all the force she can muster, two foot kicks him in the chest. The giant mascot is really solid. He's so heavy that all of her efforts only just about knocks him off balance. But it's enough. Tripping over his own giant shoes, Mickey falls backwards. His back hits the railing, and for a second, it looks like he's going to be okay. But his momentum is just too much. His feet fly up into the air as he tips back over it, tumbling down into the darkness and laughing all the way down. Crunch! Mickey lands, impaled on the spiked railings outside the lighthouse. One of the rails stabs straight through his head. His smile freezes in place. His laughter stops. Her boyfriend is not looking okay. He's barely conscious now, lying in a sickeningly large pool of blood. They need to get him to a hospital fast. Still not recovered from carrying him up the lighthouse stairs, she now has to haul him back down them. The pair leave a red trail all the way through the museum, but that's the last of her concerns at this point. Not looking across at Mickey lying dead on the railing, the girlfriend dumps her boyfriend into the passenger seat of the rental car and goes round to the driver's side. She doesn't have a license, but she did a few lessons this year. Should be fine, the roads will be empty. All she needs to do is get them to a hospital. Her boyfriend is groaning in the passenger seat. She starts fishing through his pockets for the keys. She glances up at the mirror. Mickey is still lying on the fence, motionless. The door to the museum is closed, just like how they left it. Or wait, did they leave it open? She tries the other pocket. Her boyfriend is trying to say something. She shushes him. He can tell her later, but he keeps trying, raising his uninjured arm. He points at something on the dashboard. Her mouse ears, what's the big deal? They've already dealt with Mickey Mouse. No, wait, not Mickey, Minnie. Bang! Two large dents appear on the car's roof right above their heads. The girlfriend desperately turns back to her boyfriend, searching pocket after pocket for these keys. Why does he have so many damn pockets on these shorts? She glances out the window and stops dead still, peering through the glass at her, head upside down as she leans over from the roof. Minnie Mouse waves at her. The gloved hand stops moving and points at the third pocket down on the left. The girlfriend reaches into it and finds the keys. Minnie gives a big double thumbs up, tilts her head back, and slams it into the glass. Bang! Bang! Again and again, she pounds her forehead on the windshield. The glass sags and fractures into smaller and smaller pieces. The girlfriend doesn't have time to sit and wait, though. She stabs the keys into the car and starts the engine. Slamming the accelerator to the floor, the car shoots off into the night. Minnie gives her another double thumbs up, winds a hand back, and punches it through the window. The girlfriend screams. The hand grabs the top of her boyfriend's head and starts to slowly twist it around. No matter how much she swerves the car, the girlfriend can't knock the mouse off the roof. Round and round her boyfriend's head goes. Crunch! His vertebrae detached and grate against each other. His head is looking all the way backwards at his seat, but Minnie keeps turning it, round and round, until he's looking straight forwards again, neck crumpled and splitting, eyes lifeless. Minnie puts a hand to her mouth and giggles. Oops! The road disappears from under the car, and it free falls for a second, the nose tipping forward. Crash! The nose lands first, tipping the car forwards and throwing the girlfriend through what remains of the windscreen. She tumbles across the sand, feeling her arms snapping underneath her as she goes. In a blur, she tries to get to her feet, but collapses. Rolling onto her back, she stares up at the stars as the sea laps against her cheek. A pair of giant round ears with a little pink bow block her view. Minnie peers down at her, spotting the girl's broken arm. With two giant gloved hands, she reaches down and takes the arm in her grip, breaking it back the other way and shoving it together until it resembles how it used to look. Minnie gives her the double thumbs up. The girlfriend doesn't even try to move. This is it. She's accepted her fate. But Minnie looks sad. Putting her hands under the girlfriend's armpits, she lifts her up and puts her back on her feet. She makes that same shooting motion Mickey did before. The girlfriend stumbles back a couple of paces, but falls over again. 
Exasperated, Minnie throws her hands in the air, picks the girlfriend up again, and puts her back on her feet. Minnie points at her. You. She then makes a little running motion with her fingers and points off up the beach. You run. Just kill me, the girlfriend says, exhaustion racking her every word. Minnie puts her head in her hands, even more exasperated than before. The mouse puts her hands together and makes a begging motion. Please? The girlfriend just stands there. Minnie throws her arms in the air, looks down at the girl, and shrieks, baring all her teeth. She stays put. Minnie pushes her over, jumps down into a straddling position, and punches the girlfriend in the head with her gloved hand. Pain fills the girl's head, shooting the fear back into her. With nothing left, the girl pushes herself free and stumbles away from Minnie. She hobbles up the beach, blood flowing freely down either side of her head. She's going as fast as she can, but it's barely faster than a walk. Behind her, Minnie is covering her eyes and counting on an outstretched hand, playing hide-and-seek. There's nowhere for her to go, though, nowhere to hide. They're just on an open beach, stretching out in front of her and behind her. Nowhere to go, except... She splashes out into the sea, up to her knees, her waist, her chest. Now she's just fully swimming. Her broken arm screams at her from the motion. She barely has the strength to kick. Salt water splashes up into her ear holes and feels like it's washing straight into her brain. The world sounds strange and choked. The girl cranes her neck around to see Minnie standing on the shore. The mouse waves at her enthusiastically. The girl waves back. Minnie giggles. The two of them stay like that for almost an hour, the girl steadily dying in the sea, trying to stay afloat, Minnie waiting enthusiastically on the shore. With each wave, the girl is slowly brought closer and closer to the mouse, until she's lying helplessly at the creature's giant feet. The last thing she sees is a pair of giant, round ears. Turns out she had been wrong. You can absolutely win a fight with a pair of Minnie Mouse ears. Next time you're considering going on vacation in the state of Florida, it would be wise of you to avoid reading any brochures you may come across just in case you come across SCP-3640, a seemingly harmless brochure. SCP-3640 can be found all across the state, though it is currently unknown how they come into being. These brochures will promote self-guided tours within the state, all of areas that have particular ghost stories, folklore, or rumors of hauntings attached to them. These tours are free and promise tourists an up-close and personal look at the haunted history of Florida. However, most are not prepared for just how up-close these tours end up being. If you read this brochure and decide to go along to the location advertised at the time it lists, you will be met with instances of SCP-3640-Alpha. In this case, these creatures manifested themselves as Mickey and Minnie Mouse. However, they can take the form of any uniformed mascots associated with the Walt Disney Media conglomerate. These mascots will hunt you down mercilessly, but with all the charm and squeaky clean joy we all know and love. Live ammunition does little to stop these SCPs when directed at the body, but a clean headshot has been proven to do the trick. It is fortunate then for our tourist couple that Mickey's head was impaled on the railing. What is less fortunate, however, is that they were there together. This is because SCP-3640 has a few interesting rules for how it operates. In order for SCP-3640-Alpha instances to engage in the hunt, every member of the party has to have read the brochure. If a group of five go to a haunted house at the designated time, but only four of them have read the brochure, they will enjoy a nice, spooky, but safe evening. If all members of the party have read the brochure, however, the same number of mascots will manifest and hunt them down. For a group of 20 college students, you can only imagine the colorful range of Disney characters that come out to play. These SCPs will also only remain within their state borders. If you find yourself being hunted down, you can either run for the border or find a good place to hide until the times allotted for your self-guided tour come to an end. It remains unclear how these SCPs grow, reproduce, or where they go outside of their hunting times, if they continue to exist at all. Who knows, there are a lot of back rooms in Disney World with all mascot costumes lying around. The Walt Disney Company is under continuous surveillance to ascertain any link between SCP-3640 and the brand themselves. To this day, a letter from the company to a local governor in 1979 is the only tie to have been found between them and the creatures. It reads, Dear Governor Askew, the Walt Disney Company thanks you for your cooperation in this matter regarding the unlicensed Walt Disney character operators. 
Please pass along the following information collected by the outstanding men and women of the City of Orlando's Police Department to the Florida National Guard. If a character is spotted, call to get its attention and then rapidly flash your flashlights at the costume. If it does not flinch, fire on sight. Aim at the head if possible. Else, aim at the knees to disable them and then finish them off with headshots. Body shots have been known to lack effectiveness. Deceased characters are to be incinerated. No other means of disposal are advised. We are currently pursuing alternative legal means of shutting down these unlicensed operators and hope to achieve a settlement within the end of the year. Cordially yours, The Walt Disney Company. All he could see were glimpses, flashes of movement, but he could clearly make out that there was a girl. He could see the man walk up behind her and slip a bag over her head. There was a struggle, a body being dragged through the dark, and then the sound of a shovel scraping against the hard dirt. The body is thrown into the shallow hole, and as the dirt begins to rain down on her face, her eye opens up. The boy's eyes open too, and he sits up with a panicked jolt. Shaky and covered in sweat, he looks around his dark room and realizes that it was only a dream. The entire morning as the boy gets ready, rides the bus, and sits through school, all he can think about is the dream and the girl. A group of teenage girls are out for a ride in one of their father's sports car convertible. They're having too much fun and driving much too fast down the dark country roads. It doesn't take much. It never does. Just the shadow of an animal bolting across the road, but it's enough to make the driver jerk the wheel, causing the car to lose control. All of the girls scream, but none more than the one who is tossed from the sliding, spinning car. The girls stand around their dead friend and make a solemn pact. No one here will ever know that she was with them. But what will they do with her? One of them points towards the woods, and everyone turns to look at the dilapidated shed. As the girls, now dirty from their long night of digging and then filling a hole, emerge from the shed into the dim morning light, none of them are aware that beneath the dirt, the girl is still breathing. The boy gasps for air and struggles in the dark. He throws the blankets off of him before realizing that he is safe in his own bed. Another breakfast, another ride to school, another day of classes where the boy can think of nothing but the girl from his dreams. Who is she? He's never seen her in his life, he's sure of it. But then why does she keep appearing in his dreams? The boy is snapped out of his deep train of thought by the teacher slapping his desk, and he apologizes before focusing on his studies once again. The look on the woman's face is a mix of sadness and annoyance. She doesn't know how much longer she can go on like this. It never stops. How can someone cough so much? The woman sits in her chair and tries to push away the same thought that comes to her over and over, that it would be better for both of them if it would just end. The girl coughs loudly in her bed. The disease has ravaged her lungs, and it takes all of her willpower not to scratch at the burning, itching sores on her face and chest. She looks towards the door with dazed eyes and sees her mother enter the room. She's carrying a tray with soup, just like she always does at this time, even though she has no appetite at all. As her mother gets closer, she can see that the tray is empty, and it isn't a tray in her hands. It's a pillow. The girl can barely muster a scream as the woman places the pillow over her daughter's face. As the mother walks out of the old shed in the backyard and towards the house, she stops for a moment. Can she hear the sound of coughing coming from the shed? That morning at breakfast, the boy's father tells him in no uncertain terms that he doesn't want to hear any more about the girl. It's just a dream, and he needs to put it out of his mind. What he needs to be focusing on is school. The note from his teacher said that he isn't paying attention in class, and if that keeps up, he's going to have much bigger problems. The boy promises, no more about the girl. As the boy stares out the bus window, it isn't his fault that thoughts about his dream rush into his head. Because as the bus drives along the country roads, he catches a glimpse of something down a long, tree-covered driveway. It's the house from his dream. The shed door opens with a creak, allowing a sliver of light from the full moon to fall inside. The boy enters the shed as quietly as he can and goes inside. He soon emerges with his bike and a shovel strapped to his back before riding away from his own backyard into the night. The boy stops his bike at the bottom of the driveway leading up to the old abandoned house. He rides up the drive and doesn't even consider stopping at the house. His destination is somewhere else. The boy lets his bike fall to the ground in the backyard and stares at it. It's the shed he's seen so many times before, despite never seeing it in person. It's dark and quiet, the shed silhouetted against the large, bright moon. 
He approaches the only door on the small shed and reaches for the handle. It opens with a loud, rusty squeak. The boy takes out a flashlight and turns it on, illuminating the shed's interior. Inside is nothing except for a wooden bench sitting on the dirt floor. But wait, there is something else. A spot on the ground appears different, blackened, almost as if it were burned. This is the spot, though. This is the place the boy keeps seeing in his dreams. He knows she's down there. She needs his help. The boy thrusts his shovel down into the dirt, but it doesn't even scratch the surface. The ground is cold and hard. He strikes down again, and the shovel pierces into the dirt. The shovel suddenly falls to the ground, though, as the boy begins to cough. He drops to his knees as the coughing becomes a fit. He can't stop, and now he can't breathe. It feels like his throat is filling with something. He falls to the ground, still coughing as he feels whatever is filling his throat and lungs moving and vibrating. The final great hacking cough, he unleashes a swarm of creatures from his mouth. He lies in the dirt, struggling but unable to get any air, as the buzz of thousands of locusts drowns out his final noises. It's no surprise that what this young man ran into wasn't a dream at all, but an interaction with an anomaly that has since been classified as SCP-4595, but also has the quite simple and appropriate name of Witch. SCP-4595 is the designation given to a small room located inside of a woodshed that is itself found behind a home near the town of Jasper, Indiana. The house appears to have been abandoned for some time, and there are no reliable records of who the home's most recent or original owners were. The only item inside the woodshed is a simple, rough-hewn wooden bench, though at the time of the anomaly's discovery, two other objects were found as well. The first was a small shovel, the type that might be used for gardening. The shovel appears to be ordinary in every way, except for the very tip which has what looks to be a blood stain on it, though tests have been unable to retrieve any genetic material from the discoloration. The second object was a small human skeleton. The body of the deceased person was removed from the woodshed, and an autopsy revealed that it had belonged to an adolescent male, roughly 11 to 13 years old. While the exact cause of death was unable to be determined, it is extremely likely that it was due to the anomalous effects that SCP-4595 produces, but more on those in a moment. Further examination of the woodshed reveals that the word witch has been scrawled on the door with charcoal, though it is unknown who wrote the message and whether it is meant to serve as a warning or has some other purpose. It is highly likely, though, that the word is referring to the final element of SCP-4595, the body that is buried beneath the woodshed's dirt floor. Ground-penetrating imaging tools were brought in to investigate the shed, and researchers discovered that underneath one portion of the floor that appears to have been scorched at some point, a body is buried roughly one meter beneath the surface, which has since been designated as SCP-4595-A. Scans have revealed the body to be a humanoid figure, vaguely feminine in appearance. Its limbs are twisted in a painful and unnatural manner. There are several large wounds present on its face, chest, and neck. But perhaps strangest of all, is that despite evidence at the site pointing to the location not having been disturbed for many years, the corpse buried beneath does not seem to show any signs at all of decomposition, still appearing as it most likely did at the time it was interred in the ground. You are most likely asking yourself why the SCP Foundation has relied solely on subterranean imaging in order to assess the state of SCP-4595-A, and why they don't simply dig up the anomalous corpse. The reason why they haven't is due to the anomalous effects present at the site. Testing on SCP-4595 has concluded that anyone who enters the shed and remains there for any substantial amount of time will begin to experience a number of effects. First, they will start to feel paranoid, getting the impression that someone is watching them. This purely mental effect is quickly followed by a physical one, where the individual's skin will start to itch. Those who linger in SCP-4595 long enough will eventually begin to violently scratch at themselves in an attempt to relieve the itchiness. These effects, while very uncomfortable, will eventually subside if they leave the location, and it is very likely that they are meant to serve as a warning of what will happen if one partakes in the most dangerous aspect of SCP-4595, which is disturbing the body buried beneath it. Anyone who attempts to impact SCP-4595-A by attempting to dig it up or otherwise remove it from the location will quickly experience a horrendous anomalous effect. The individual will soon find that they are experiencing a shortness of breath and soon will begin coughing and choking and be unable to breathe at all. 
This is due to a phenomenon in which any empty space in their chest cavity, lungs, airways, stomach, and intestines will completely fill with Schistocerca gregaria, better known as the desert locust. The insects will continue to appear within the individual's body until they expire, a process that typically takes mere minutes. Any locusts that manage to escape the individual's body, most often through the mouth and nose, will disappear into a vapor that quickly dissipates the moment they cross the threshold of the woodshed's doorway. So far, no method has been determined that can prevent any of SCP-4595's effects, and for the time being, no personnel are allowed to enter the anomalous shed except for testing purposes. But even in those cases, the disturbance of SCP-4595-A is not allowed. Due to the relative ease with which the Foundation can secure the site and is able to prevent anyone from entering, it has been classified as safe, with the additional disruption class of dark and the risk class of warning. Just what is SCP-4595? Is the SCP-4595-A body a victim, doomed to an eternity beneath this ramshackle shed? Or is it a monster, sealed away for some unknown purpose, the only warning for us to stay away being a single word on the door? Maybe one day we'll finally know the answer to why SCP-4595 is only known as the Witch. As night falls, Everything sinks into a soft blue darkness under a blanket of twinkling stars. In a nice, cozy home, in a normal, quiet suburb, a sweet little boy is being read a bedtime story by his mother. It's a classic, Little Red Riding Hood, the story of a little girl traveling through the woods to her grandmother's house, only to be set upon by the big bad wolf. A tale as old as time, with an important message for people of all ages. We should fear what lurks in the dark since what is there is often waiting and watching with hungry eyes. As the boy lays in bed, clutching the top of his blanket, his mother continues telling him the tale. She describes the tiny girl in the red hood, holding a little wicker basket, stumbling through the dark. The wolf, with its big, hungry eyes, weaves through the darkness of the trees, following her every move. The little boy can barely contain his fear when Little Red Riding Hood opens the door to her grandmother's old cottage and creeps inside, where she realizes that something is very wrong. Her grandmother looks… different. Those great big eyes, that twitching wet black nose, those huge terrible teeth dripping with saliva. All the better to eat you with, my dear. His mother senses that her son isn't taking this well, and notices that he's shuddering underneath the blankets. She closes the book, smiles, and insists that the story has a happy ending. This does nothing to ease the growing specter of fear stretching out over the boy. Could the big bad wolf be waiting outside his window, watching him with those red, ravenous eyes? Would the window really keep such a monster at bay? He doesn't feel so sure. The little boy's mother kisses him on the forehead and tells him that if he needs anything, she and his father are just down the hall. He's been having nightmares lately, but that's all they are. Nightmares, all in his head. Nothing in there could actually hurt him. He's alone now, shivering in bed, trying to focus on the light of his tiny nightlight plugged into his wall, a little glowing friend that will watch over him and keep him safe. His mom and dad got it for him when he told them he was afraid of the dark. But there's still a lot more dark in this room than light. His closet door suddenly creaks open, and he bites his tongue to stifle a scream. It's an old door, it opens by itself sometimes. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about at all. It's a mantra his parents had drilled into him on prior instances when this door had creaked open. Even in the dark, the little boy can make out something. It looks like one of the many other shadows created by his nightlight, but it's different. Something darker than the dark. And it's moving, sliding out of his closet. A fog shaped like some unknowable creature. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about at all, he tells himself over and over again. The fog leaves the closet entirely, and it starts getting closer to the boy's bed. As it rises up from the floor, the boy can see something in the fog. He can see eyes. Big, glowing, hungry eyes. Like the eyes of a big bad wolf, ready to eat him alive. He opens his mouth to scream, but only a yawn comes out. He wants to get up and run to his parents' room down the hall, but his body feels so heavy, his movements so slow and sluggish. He can't move, and the eyes of the monster made of dark keep getting closer. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to… Mom? Dad? Please help me? All he can do is think about screaming, not actually make any noise. 
as his eyes shut, and he drifts off into the land of dreams. He opens his eyes to find that he's standing in a dark and endless forest. The trees are tall, extending up into a black and starless sky. But there's something wrong with them. Bodies, hundreds of them, old and desiccated, are speared onto their branches, their faces locked into what looks like permanent, silent screams. A thick, viscous black liquid drips from some of the bodies, pooling into what looks like puddles of tar around his feet. When he looks down, he sees that he's wearing strange, old-fashioned clothes. His shirt is bright red. There's a low, bassy growling behind him, like thunder, like a rumbling earthquake, primal and deadly. He can feel it vibrating in his bones. Moving slowly, as though he was underwater, he turns and sees the beast looming behind him. A giant, wolf-like monster made from shadows, teeth cut from jagged black glass, eyes glowing and hungry. He's never been so terrified in his life as he is right now, standing in front of this monster that seemed to be the literal embodiment of fear. The embodiment of deep, animal terror. The beast that haunts the dreams of every frightened boy and girl. It growls again, and he begins to run. But it's not real running. It's dream running, as if the gravity were too strong, slow and cumbersome through the thick, confining air. He keeps pushing through the resistance all around him, but the wolf made of shadows moves quickly. It weaves through the trees, its mouth dripping wet with hunger, its eyes emitting a dim glow like the nightlight back in his bedroom. He runs for what feels like hours, tears streaking down his cheeks, until finally he can see salvation in the distance, a house standing in the middle of a clearing in the woods. But not just any house, it's his house. In the logic of the dream, he knew that his mom and dad would be inside. They'd help him, they'd keep him safe from the monster. He just needs to get there. He just needs to survive. He finally reaches the front door and tries to open it, but it's locked. So he hammers his fists against the wood, screaming and crying for his parents. He looks over his shoulder and sees the shadow wolf charging towards him through the darkness of the woods, its huge dark feet hitting the ground with the speed and force of gunshots, getting closer and closer and closer. With one final desperate pound of his fist, the door to his home finally swings open and he falls through. The door closes behind him as he hits the floor, and the sound of the wolf is gone. He gets up and looks out of a nearby window to see that there's no forest outside, just his neighborhood again, underneath a starless sky. He looks down and sees he's not wearing those strange, old-fashioned clothes anymore, just the same pajamas he'd worn to bed. Are things back to normal now? Had it all been a dream? He tries a nearby light switch, but nothing happens, still dark. That dread comes creeping back in. If it had been a dream, what did that make this? He starts making his way up the stairs, calling out to his mom and dad, but there's no response. He climbs further, walking down the hallway towards their bedroom door. The hallway seems so much longer than he remembered it, but for some reason, he never stops to question the discrepancy. He just wants his mother and father. Not long after, the little boy reaches the door to his parents' bedroom and opens it. The room is so dark, but he can make out their forms lying in the bed. He approaches, calling for them again, but there's no response. Instead, he just hears an awful wheezing sound, like air being let out of a balloon. When his eyes adjust to the dark, he sees that something is terribly wrong with both of his parents. They're now old and thin, with sickly yellowing skin hanging from their bones. Their eyes, milky with cataracts, are set deep in their jaundiced faces. The mere sight of them forces a gasp out of him. Their heads slowly turn with audible crunches. Their chests rise and fall in those same slow, mechanical exhalations. They both look like life hurts for them now. The little boy begins to cry. They beckon him closer, wanting to comfort him. But he's too terrified of their appearance to take a single step towards them. His mother opens her thin-lipped mouth, revealing rotten teeth, and says, Sweetheart, I'm so sorry, but mommy and daddy can't take care of you anymore. We can't even be here for much longer. We need to go. I'm sorry that we don't have more time. The little boy can see his parents aging by the second, getting thinner and frailer and sicker right in front of him. His pity and fear outweighs his revulsion, and he steps forward to embrace them. They're so terribly cold. He grips his mother's hand but he can feel the bones turning to dust inside her paper-thin skin. 
It's going to be okay, darling, she whispers, her voice hoarse and brittle in her final moments. Your grandmother will take care of you from now on. That's when he hears it behind him again. That terrible, low rumble, the primal growl. As his parents both turn to dust in their bed, he turns and sees the monster, the same wolf made of shadows, filling up the doorway. It seems even bigger in here, bulging through the doorway, thick black saliva dripping from its obsidian fangs. He tries to repeat that same mantra to himself. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about at all. But suddenly he's short of breath, as an immense shadowy claw closes around his torso. It lifts him up off the ground until he can feel the beast's breath on his face. But it isn't hot like it should be. It's freezing, like a gust of wind in the deep snow. With a deep, commanding voice, the monster says, Only lucky children get to wake up from a dream like this. And not everyone can be lucky. All he can do is scream when the wolf's jaws close around his head. But not a soul can hear him. He's swallowed up into the darkness of the monster, and soon, he's nothing at all. In the waking world, the sun rises, morning birds caw and tweet, alarms go off. But when the little boy's mother checks his bed that morning, it's empty. He's vanished without a trace. In the panic of the days, weeks, and months that follow, in the extensive search that turns up nothing, and that unlucky little boy was never seen again, it never even occurs to his parents to ask, did we leave that closet door open? Did you suffer from bad dreams as a child? Night terrors? There's no shame in it. It's not an uncommon affliction after all. Perhaps there's a hazy, half-formed memory in your mind of waking up screaming when your parents turned on the lights, comforting you, telling you that it was just a bad dream and nothing more. But what if it wasn't? What if it was SCP-080? This vaporous entity, nicknamed the Dark Form by some who have worked with it, is every child's worst nightmare. And if you give it a chance, every adult's worst nightmare too. That's because this black, smoke-like figure has the anomalous ability to induce extreme drowsiness in anyone who spends more than half an hour near it in the dark. Shortly after falling asleep, if nobody comes in and rescues the victim by turning on the lights, they will experience the most horrible nightmares you can possibly imagine. So horrible, in fact, that those who have suffered these nightmares and survive often experience irreparable, lifelong psychological trauma. And in the grand scheme of things, those are still the lucky ones. If you're unlucky, like the little boy who vanished from his bed, you'll disappear forever, consumed by SCP-080. The creature itself is difficult to properly see due to its lack of consistent form and due to the fact that it only appears in the darkness, but those who have witnessed it can only seem to remember one key detail, glowing eyes in the smoke. Because of its preference for dark places, SCP-080 often takes refuge in closets and under the bed, where it can vanish out of sight. Bright light automatically causes the creature to disappear and manifest elsewhere, and therefore, should you start feeling unusually drowsy in the dark, turning on the lights is the best thing to do. But these must be bright lights. The soft glow of a standard children's night light is not powerful enough to ward off the creature. The SCP Foundation conducted a series of experiments, hoping to see whether SCP-080 had any kind of real physical body, and if it was possible for human beings to safely interact with it. In the first of these experiments, a 19-year-old male D-Class was sent into the chamber to interact with SCP-080. Unsurprisingly, he immediately became extremely distressed upon seeing the figure with glowing eyes forming in the dark. He described it as being human-shaped, but far too big to be a human. He begged to be released from the chamber, but by this point, he'd already started yawning and the drowsiness was setting in. The researchers running the experiment wanted to see what would happen next, though, and eventually, his pleas to be released fell silent as he drifted off to sleep. When guards were finally sent in to check on him, they found… nothing at all. Nothing remained of the D-Class. He'd been consumed by SCP-080, just like so many others. Next, a 30-year-old female D-Class was sent into SCP-080's chamber. When she was able to make out the vaporous form with the glowing eyes, she was instructed to try and physically touch it. She followed the orders. However, upon touching the entity directly, she immediately fell unconscious. She was quickly retrieved from the room, since the Foundation wanted to make sure they could interview her rather than letting SCP-080 consume her. 
According to a physical exam given to her by the Foundation medics, she'd experienced no physical effects. Her mind, on the other hand, was a very different story. She'd vacillate wildly between a state of borderline catatonia and extreme paranoid distress. In a debriefing meeting with a Foundation researcher, she had difficulty recounting what exactly had happened during her test with SCP-080. When she did begin to recollect, she started screaming in terror and yelling about how they would try to take her back to the monster. Then, without warning, she leaped across the table and began to attack the researcher, forcing the attending guards to intervene, and unfortunately, they were forced to terminate her. It seemed as though this was always the intended effect of her outburst. She preferred death from a Foundation guard over experiencing SCP-080 again. The testing continued, though, and a third subject was sent into the room, a 24-year-old D-class male dosed on a powerful amphetamine to hopefully ward off the drowsiness-inducing effects of SCP-080. This did not appear to work, though, and over time, the same sleepiness started to set in. The amphetamine, however, still caused elevated levels of aggression, and the D-class began to express violent intent towards SCP-080. He approached the vaporous mass and attempted to strike it, but when his fist touched the entity, he immediately collapsed. When his body was retrieved, it was found that he died of a sudden massive heart attack. During the autopsy, as Foundation staff examined his body, they reported feeling a profound sense of discomfort and unease, as though they were being watched. The retrieval team also reported feeling acutely aware of SCP-080 watching them as they exited the chamber with the final D-Class's body. The mere presence of SCP-080 then started causing problems for some staff members at the containment site. The researchers assigned to SCP-080 reported strange and unsettling dreams and that they were occurring at an unusually frequent level, disrupting their sleep patterns and, by extension, their work performance. This led to them discovering the possibility that SCP-080 may have some kind of hazardous mimetic effect that can linger among its victims even when they aren't in its direct proximity. After the lead researcher on the team walked into traffic and sadly passed away, it was made mandatory for all staff members working in SCP-080's sector to keep comprehensive dream journals so that the emergence of patterns of violent or unsettling dreams could be detected before things got too out of hand, just like they had with the lead researcher. However, the lead researcher would not be the last to lose his life to SCP-080. Two researchers stood just beyond the blackout curtains, observing SCP-080 for 40 minutes, believing that the divider would keep them safe from SCP-080's negative anomalous effects. They were terribly wrong. Both apparently fell asleep in the observation area, and when another researcher later entered the room, they discovered that their bodies were gone. However, strangely enough, everyone working in that sector of the site found that they did have a better night's sleep after the incident. Staff were reminded to exercise maximum caution whenever interfacing with SCP-080. Their direct exposure should never exceed 30 minutes under any circumstances, even the section of staff members that, for some reason, are completely unable to see SCP-080 and appear to somehow be immune to its effects. Considering the fact that everyone around the site started feeling better after the strange incident concerning the two missing researchers, researchers have sought O5 Council permission to feed a D-Class to the monster once a month in order to negate the damaging effects it has on site staff mental health. Despite the protests of the Ethics Committee, a member of the Council approved the measure. SCP-080 is contained in a 4 meter by 4 meter room with a smaller antechamber located on the south wall for easy research access. There's also an observation room on the north wall, separated with blackout curtains to prevent light from getting in and dispersing SCP-080. Containment procedures dictate that SCP-080 should never, under any circumstances, be removed from the chamber. Any light-producing devices are also forbidden. While the Foundation currently has this monster under lock and key, all it would take is a stray ray of light to free it once more, which has warranted it being given the Euclid containment class. All members of staff are also kindly remembered to stop referring to this creature as the Boogeyman. After all, there's a lot of power in giving a fear-manipulating creature a name like that, and the last thing we want is SCP-080 having more power than it already has. Now go and watch another entry from the classified files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1471, Mallow version 1.0.0, for another SCP that won't leave you alone once it has you in its sights. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.